good evening, ladies and gents, wherever you may be around the world. And welcome to our long threatened stream on John Charmy's book, Splendid Isolation, but on the Balance of Power, 1874-1914. Um, as always, I'm going to start us off with a bit of a tune, which will give people um, in the audience time to get in. Okay, that was uh, obviously the end of Hope and Glory. Uh, good day to the chat. Um, I think that Adam is probably going to join us at some point, but obviously it's a work night, so he's probably running a bit late. Um, I'm going to start these things off the same way that I normally do. Now, obviously, we're looking at John Charmley's book, Splendid Isolation, uh, Britain and the Balance of Power, 1874 to 1914, which I think was published in 2010, if I remember correctly. Uh, and I'm going to start us off with uh, Rupert. Rupert, would there be uh, a few opening points you'd like to make for the book? Uh, the main point that really stuck out to me is the contrast between, obviously, knowing how this period of, di of uh, diplomacy turns out compared to what they thought they were getting into. I think that's quite important to sort of bear in mind. And it's, it's not mentioned terribly frequently, but the idea of, the, of any, uh, <clears throat> any expected war not really going beyond a limited war and and uh you know perhaps it takes the character of uh, heaven forbid a russo-japanese style war that escalates a bit beyond sort of what uh, most people would like but still it's it's quite limited in scope and uh, doesn't turn into a total war for either for either nation so when they thought they were making commitments it was mainly based around the idea of a small troop deployment in a limited area um a la the crimean war and maybe a deployment of well no definitely a deployment of the navy but mainly that it would be relying on those two those two entities not turning into some kind of like grand conscript army that would be rampaging across uh, europe and dying in the hundreds of thousands yes totally agree 
Um, were, were, were there other points you wanted to bring up as openers, uh, Rupert? Um, I mean, that's that's mainly what I kind of tried to uh, hang on to. It's it. So the um, the turn with regards to Russia was quite quite interesting, and uh, I kept a close eye on that, believing as I have for a long time that we are kind of on the wrong side of the uh, mm. Crimean War and the War of eighteen seventy seven seventy eight, the Russo Turkish War. So. Well, I don't think we were on the wrong side from our point of view, but maybe from the point of view of Europe, we were. <clears throat> well, yes, this is the point. I mean, for Britain, it was about keeping the Russian fleet out of the Mediterranean in both cases, really. Well, I mean, that's not the justification that's, that's uh, explained in the book. They thought that the, um, the only thing standing between um, Russia and India was Constantinople, which seems absurd, really. Yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, the, the point is if, if Russia gets access to the Mediterranean, that in turn allows Russia to put pressure on Britain in the Mediterranean, which, you know, it couldn't do from the Black Sea. Yeah. and um, I've yeah. heard that justification, but it wasn't mentioned in the book, I don't think. Yeah. I, yes. I think he, do, he does talk about it, but more in the early days, the Israeli uh, part than in the second part of the book. In the second part of the book, as was happening at the time, um, Britain was more concerned about Persia because of Russian influence in northern Persia and Britain being only able to influence southern Persia because that's the bit we could get to from the sea. I mean, in any case, even if they can get into the Mediterranean, what does that really net them? Not, not well, all that much compared to the resources I, I, that we can bring to bear. I, I think the main motive behind it is that during this time, I think Russia was, I believe, the third most powerful fleet in the world. And yeah. so, yes, it was. Um, well, Britain, France, and Germany. Uh, sorry, Britain, France, and Russia at that stage. Yes. Yeah. So, um, a, um, a well poised Russian fleet could then just sever any use of Britain's, uh, Britain's use of the Mediterranean if it was fortunate. I mean, Britain's Navy was a whole lot bigger than Russia's at the time. Yeah, I, I don't and think could they could be necessarily... singularly brought to bear. That's a, I think that's a pretty key yeah. point. Yeah, I mean, I, we, I, they discovered quite quite promptly in the uh, Russo-Japanese War. That... <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's, uh, there's that old thing that like um, everyone fight uh, everyone fights the the last day of the last war, and I think that was particularly the case with the Russians. I don't think they were expecting what they saw. Um, but but I think that uh, it's it's worth pointing out that I, whilst I don't think Russia could have beaten Britain in the Mediterranean, they could have caused the British quite a lot of problems in the Mediterranean. Um, Cyprus had recently become British, in fact, over, under under Beaconsfield, under under Disraeli. Um, Britain was occupying Egypt from 1882 onwards, much to the chagrin of the French. Um, and also there was obviously Malta and Gibraltar, which were uh, uh, British possessions. So uh, Russia certainly could have caused problems for Britain in the Mediterranean, even though I don't think they necessarily would have won. This is surely leaning into a greyism by just treating as treating Russia as just the uh, the the ultimate evil, um, and anything yeah. they do is kind of like leaning into that angle. Whereas, no, I, th I, I think the point being raised is that um, Russia, ru uh, if you can restrict another great power's access to a, um, to a resource, it's probably best you can do so, particularly when you're Britain and uh, trade flows are very important. Yeah. I th I th I think that would would be the case being made. But. I mean, the the other thing to bear in mind, of course, uh, Rupert, is that the Suez Canal was vital to Britain in those days because it was the link between India and the Far East and and, and the rest of the empire via the Mediterranean. And again, Britain didn't want the Russian Navy interfering with that stuff, and that was really the main justification for Britain going to war in the Crimea against Russia and for supporting the Turks in 1878 when it looked like. Um, but in fact, very, it was very likely that the, the Russians were going to be able to occupy Constantinople. Mm. I mean, we might look at it now and think that would have been a good thing, but you know, looking at it from the British point of view in, in 1878, that's not really so clear at all. Yeah, yeah from a long-run point of view, I would argue it's a good thing, but definitely from a short-run, pragmatic foreign policy point of view, I mean... Do you want a strategic resource in the decaying power you can control or a non-decaying power you can't control? The choice is pretty obvious. Yeah. Um, well, they shackle yeah, themselves to the corpse in the process, though. And the moment that it gets even remotely propped up, it, it kind of like falls into the lap of its enemy, in, into the lap of our enemy. So we kind of like propped up 
you know, propped up the corpse for long enough that it could be a liability to us and then uh, and then gave it away as an asset the moment that it might have been useful. Well, I, I, Salisbury was, was uh, one of the things the book does certainly bring up is that Salisbury in his, uh, in his even in his um, earlier 1880s uh, position as foreign secretary was looking at um, stopping British support for, for Turkey. He didn't actually do it because there were more problems doing it than not, but he, he certainly considered it. Mm. Yeah, so, I mean, to me, this is just, just this is just another greyism of treating Russia as as the arch enemy whose whose every move is uh, is bent towards just domination. When you could have when we could have very easily got into the ground floor of of uh, like Russian ec uh, economic development and soft power. Would, well, only if, I, 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 only if the, the Russians had been willing to do that, and they showed no desire to do so. Um, in, in, in the 1880s and 1890s, Russia wasn't interested in an alliance with Britain. Um, I mean, earlier than that, they were. We, we yeah, in the 1850s, they were for sure. Yeah, yeah. But, so, which is beyond the scope of the book, of course. But yeah, in yeah. The after, 1850s, we, after we kicked them in the teeth, they probably weren't so uh, so happy about the idea of well, making friends. Yeah, I mean, after the after the Russian Black Sea fleet was destroyed by the British, and they were they, the, 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 they basically were kept out of the Mediterranean for what well, all the era up until the the, the the turn of the century, basically. Um, so from that point of view, the Crimean War was relatively successful from Britain's point of view, but there we go. Yeah, I mean, in terms of how it, how it achieved its uh, its diplomatic aims, then it was very successful, but those diplomatic aims were very wrong, I would say. Um, I'm, as I say, it, it's much more difficult to look at this from the point of view of a 19th century British politician and see the Russians as, as being um, nice guys. Because Russia was still expanding in, in the late 19th century. In fact, it was expanding very fast, especially in Central Asia. Uh, and whilst I agree that the fears of Russia sending a vast army down through the Khyber Pass were pretty exaggerated because of the lack of um, terrain and, uh, sorry, the lack of roads and communications and all the rest of it, <clears throat> they, those fears were nonetheless um, genuinely held, and they were genuinely, genuinely held by a lot of British generals, etc., as well. So um, it's easy for us now to look back on that and say, "Oh, yeah, well, actually, the Russians weren't much of a threat." And of course, we know that Russia was handily defeated by Japan in 1904, but no one knew that in in, in the 1880s and the 1890s. <laughs> um, George. Yeah, sorry, sorry Ruben, that, 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 that. <laughs> I, was, I was just going to say. I think it usually I would be the one to I, I would be the one to defend uh, people's uh, assumptions in the past who may not have necessarily known better. But I think that's one uh, assumption which is perhaps fair to question their judgment on. Much like the Germans, um, basically hollow belief that they couldn't win a war with Russia Russia past 1915. You, you've also, though, got to look at another thing that, that one of the things the book does bring out that one of the people Salisbury was trying, or actually two nations that Salisbury was trying to be friendly with, were Austria Hungary, Austria Hungary, and uh, Italy. And any British um, rapprochement with um, Russia would have kiboshed both of those immediately, especially the Austria Hungary Hungarians who were. Uh, you know, deeply concerned about Russian influence in the Balkans. I mean, you know, look at what actually started World War One in the end, anyway. Yeah. And also, the other thing that Charlie points out in the book is that had Britain done that, uh, and as happened when Gray came to power and, and adopted the, the Franco-Russian policy, pro-Franco-Russian policy, um, the, the um, Austro-Hungarians were left nowhere else to go but the Germans. Yes. Um, um, and I know, for example, uh, Apollostic Majesty has actually uh, done quite a lot of content on Austria-Hungary and its problems in this era. Um, so, you know, I, I, I do think that, that, that uh, Austria-Hungary was something that also weighed on, on British minds when they were trying to do negotiations with the Russians, certainly until Gray and the Liberals came to power in 1905. Well... I mean, the other issue there is that 
uh, Italy and Austria-Hungary are kind of not natural allies at all, considering they both have either historic or, or very present claims on uh, territorial claims on one another. So that was always going to be a bit of a yeah. dodgy proposition to try and keep and, them and, together in an alliance block. Yeah, and of course they were under under Bismarck's policy. Well, in theory, but was that yeah. ever tested? Well, when it was, of course, it, it really welched on the deal to some degree, and then later on in World War One joined the Allies um, exactly. after yeah. after a good deal of bribery, it has to be said. Yeah. Um, but um, and in the end, even that wasn't enough, and Britain and France had to send troops to Italy because the Italians got beaten so badly. Well, that's a military question with. Uh, Luigi Cadona bearing the uh, lion's share of the blame for that one, but mm. yeah. Did you did you have anything else to bring up as a first subject, uh, uh, Rupert? <laughs> no, I think that will do for now as an introduction. Right. No, 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 that's cool. That's interesting, and we'll come back to it. Um, George, what, 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 any first things you'd like to bring up? Um, so, I mean, I'm coming to this book as not a historian by profession, um, and um, one of the things that interested in me um going through it was i mean it, it's less a, it's less about the foreign policy situation and more how foreign policy seems to affect um uh, domestic politics so much um particularly um in the earlier stages of the book you get a uh, israeli saying oh, i can get this victory um to um i can show this victory as um a great advantage at home and i just thought well like um, no, no one in Britain, I don't think, would really care if we won a war, if we sn snuck something in a treaty these days. I, I don't think it, I don't think anyone cares uh, that much about modern day diplomacy. And so I did find that a very interesting sort of uh, difference. And of course, you get, you get, you get the other thing of um, enthusiasm for defence spending, um, in particular um, during the uh, during the Anglo-German arms race. Uh, we want a, and we won't wait, and all that. Um, mm. it that, was was a, that was a matter of survival, to be fair. I mean, yeah, it does also link to something that I've noticed there, which is that um, the legitimacy of every, any given uh, government could be um, much more readily diffused uh, based on the number of uh, different duties that it's assigned itself. So when government consists only of you know foreign policy, defense spending, constitutional matters, mm. pretty much not much else. Um, then really there's a lot, more, a lot more stake and a lot more um, interest in those few issues. Whereas when everything's spread out across, uh, you know, social policy and the NHS and the culture war and just any any number of the BBC and any any number of other things, then uh, all of that energy gets uh, sort of diffused across all those different areas. Mm. Yeah, I, 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 there is definitely something to be said for that. Um, I, 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 I just suppose it was very interesting for me to go in um, with, with a with a modern mind for politics, seeing someone who's um, who gets cheered on a lot because uh, he, he did one up on the Russians, it's just not something that I. It's just not. It's just not the sort of political world I would imagine um, or understand. Um, perhaps. Um, well, it was. You, you need to bear in mind, of course, that Charlie's not entirely in favour of the Israeli or his policies. No. No, <clears throat> um, Disraeli deliberately played up the jingoes. In fact, you know, jingoism as a word was invented under Disraeli. You know, we've got the men, we've got the ships, and by golly, we've got the money too, all this kind of stuff. Um, and uh, so he did play up to that public opinion stuff. Whereas people like Salisbury, um, instinctively, and I suspect probably rightly, distrusted it. Yeah. Um, there is a point on the public opinion side of things, though. I think it was basically just one line uh, in the book. But uh, he does mention that uh, public opinion as such was kind of more like the... It was their interpretation of what the newspapers were saying or what, what they were going to say, which may not necessarily be completely in line with what the public actually thought. That That's true, actually. Um, there was... Uh, I think it was the bit about um, trying to nab them and... A, a Greek island or something like that during one of the treaties um, regarding Turkey, and they, and um, it's when Britain um, got Cyprus. Yeah, and um, and uh, they, they were talking about like, well, I saw this newspaper, and uh, we're not doing good, so good right now, so we should probably get an island. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, that, that was when Britain got Cyprus. And interestingly enough, to this day, there are two huge crown bases on Cyprus that are very important to Britain and also other Western nations. Yeah, uh, there's one in Akrotiti, which I know about. Uh, yeah, a friend of mine who's in the RAF regiment was serving there um, last year. He did six months in Cyprus. The RAF regiment, for anyone in the chat who doesn't know, are the um, guys who guard air bases and also operate um, RAF anti-aircraft missiles and this kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, there's not much else for me to add. Um, I mean, one of the things I do thoroughly agree with in, um, reg um, regarding um, his concluding remarks was about how... Um, maritime warfare is obviously the way to go if you're going to do war um yep. uh, it, it, because it just keeps away from devastation and um and local areas um it, it, in terms of lessons for the present which is what i would have in mind when which is something i have in mind when reading these books um <laughs> Keeping out of war seems like a good move. Letting other people fight them is also seems like a better move. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, the, the British traditional policy, obviously, is to rely mostly on the Navy. Um, and that was what the policy that was overturned in World War I. And it had always been the British policy, you know, going back to the 1600s, basically. Um, and also, um, traditional British policy did not raise mass land armies. Even when Britain became involved on the continent in the Napoleonic Wars, uh, originally in Portugal and Spain, um, the army was, even with the Portuguese forces, was never more than 50,000 men. Uh, and although it was sufficient to clear Napoleon out of first Portugal and then Spain and then indeed to invade southern France under Wellington, um, Britain never had conscription in, in the Napoleonic era. Uh, and the, the advantage of the peninsula, you know, the Spanish and Portuguese peninsula, the Iberian peninsula, um, was that it was surrounded by a sea. And so the Royal Navy could operate all around that area. They could supply the British Army quite easily and they could dominate all the water. Um, and military theorist in the chat says even at Waterloo, they used mostly Allied troops. Yeah, Waterloo is a bit of a special case because... Uh, at Waterloo, Wellington did not have a very good army because most of the best British troops were off in America fighting the Americans who had decided that Britain fighting for our life um, against Napoleon was a good uh, point for them to try and invade Canada, which they failed to do. <coughs> but nonetheless, most of the best British troops hadn't yet returned from North America at the time of Waterloo, so Wellington had a lot of second battalions, which is why he said he had an infamous army at Waterloo, because in some respects he did. He had some good battalions and he had some very good soldiers, but uh, he, he also had some quite poor ones. And some of those allied troops that military theorists mentioned were certainly not very good. Some of them had even been fighting for Napoleon only a few months previously. So they weren't totally reliable, to say the least. Well, the, the, uh, the Grand Army was um, made up of much the same kinds of troops, Austrians and um, Oh, the, the, the army he took to Russia, yeah, it was, yes, it was yeah. very much allied. Yeah, it was. Yeah, although in Napoleon's case, of course, it was forced allied. It was what? Sorry, it was forced allied in Napoleon's case. Oh, so, yes. some of them were. Some of them were. Yeah, I, 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 to, I, my, to my recollection, the Poles joined quite happily. Oh no, the Poles. Oh, were yes, happy the Poles. because the Poles wanted to um, uh, get a bit more independence from Russia. So yeah, not surprising. Yeah. Yes, but, uh, but the uh, the desertion rates were rather high once they got the opportunity. Yeah, they, the, the desertion rates for the Grand Army were enormous right from the start. Um, and, you know, it was, it was a silly policy because uh, it, it, Napoleon assumed the Russians would fight him. And when they didn't for a long time, or at least not seriously, um, he, he didn't really know what to do. When he occupied Moscow, he didn't really know what to do because the Russians weren't interested in peace. Well, and his only real battle was not one of his finest. So oh, Borodino was an absolute yeah. bloodbath. For, yeah. for no great purpose. He, to some degree, he did the same thing at Waterloo. As Napoleon got older, he became less and less of a maneuver general and more and more of a go straight through the middle guy who relied on mass and mass artillery and, and took very heavy casualties even when he won. Um, to some degree, he changed that during the hopeless campaign in 1814 when he was trying to hold back all these allied nations. 
at Leipzig mm-hmm. and battles around that area. Um, but uh, between sort of um, 1810 onwards, he, he lost a lot of his subtlety, shall we say. And even at Waterloo, he, he did not, for example, at Waterloo attempt a flanking move, which even some of his marshals suggested to him, but he wouldn't do it. Because partly because he was convinced Wellington wasn't a good general and the British weren't good troops, because he'd never really fought them. Mm. And of course, he was wrong in that, because the British had consistently beaten the French nearly every time they fought. I mean, this doesn't really hold up in the specifics, but there is probably something also to be said for the fact that uh, after the early phase of the war, where they had the uh, the levee en masse advantage compared to the more professional, uh, professionalized aristocratic style armies of the uh, the other powers, once everybody had been uh, sort of homogenized to the same mass warfare style that France had started out with, um, suddenly the battles got a lot closer and uh, and Napoleon was shining a bit less, while well, the French yeah, be, were shining a bit less. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely correct, Rupert. I mean, you know, the, the, the nations learned stuff from Napoleon. They learned the division one core system and all the rest of it. Um, the exception to that was the British, really, yeah. um, because the British fought differently to all of the continental powers. And uh, in linear warfare, uh, if your troops don't run away because this massive French column attacks you, and instead of can bring all their muskets to bear, um, you know, 500, a 500 man British battalion could fire, fire 500 muskets at the French, whereas a French column of, say, 3,000 guys probably didn't have much more than 500 men who could fire themselves because most of those guys are deep in the column and can't use their weapons. Yeah, and it's also the. Um... This is the geometry of it. If you have um, if you have a spread out surface area, you can hit more points on a block than a block mm. can hit on on a skinny line. Yeah, so. absolutely true. Although one of the myths about the Napoleonic Wars is that there were long musketry battles between the Brits and the French in the peninsula. They were occasionally, specifically at um, Alburra, for example, where Wellington was not in charge and the British only won by the skin of their teeth and the courage of their soldiers. Uh, there were long musketry duels there, but generally speaking, what happened in the Peninsula War was that the French would attack, and Wellington would place his troops in a uh, position behind the crest of a hill or some such position. And as the French reached the top, the British would suddenly spring up, fire a volley or two, and then charge with the bayonet. It wasn't that they were standing there for 20 minutes exchanging volleys. They didn't do that, usually. Mm. Um, Fionor in the chat is saying any book suggestions on this topic well obviously when you're saying this topic do you mean the Napoleonic Wars or are you, do you mean um, uh, the the actual uh, subject of this stream we, we're digressing a little bit about the Napoleonic Wars yeah, <laughs> yeah talking um, about the, talking a, a about hundred year time. or so digression <laughs> <laughs> but, but, it, it, but it is relevant to the extent that you know the last time Britain got involved in a great earth shaking war prior to World War One in 1914 was in fact the Napoleonic Wars you know the Crimean campaign was always a relatively limited campaign but, but I mean as we were just saying many of um, <coughs> Britain's uh, entanglements in the Napoleonic Wars were similarly quite limited in uh, at least manpower scale because they were they're obviously uh, footing quite a lot of the bill in terms of support financially supporting the other powers but um, and the naval entanglements obviously and the limited troop deployments in very key strategic places but they were not raising the same kind of continental armies that everybody else was no the, the, probably, the, the, the British say. army increased in numbers, obviously, over the Napoleonic Wars, but we never yeah. introduced any form of conscription. Never did. Mm. And I the, suspect... the, the only thing the British did do was they enabled um, guys from the militia, who were like the home defence forces, to volunteer for the army. That's the only thing they did do. Yeah, and I, and I suspect they were expecting much the same from any, uh, any future war. Albeit, um, as I recall, during the Boer War, when they... Um, when they put out a call for more volunteers, I think it was they didn't they didn't introduce conscription, but they um, they had more of a mass recruitment drive. Um, they found yeah. that uh, a worrying amount of the men fell below par and were uh, had a, a number of um, ailments that made them unsuitable for um, enrollment in the military, which um, supposedly spooked them into uh, introducing a lot of the pol- uh, 
public works that uh, were aimed at improving general public health, partially because they were worried about any future war would require manpower that uh, needed to be made more suitable. Mm, fair enough. Um, Fionor was saying that early on it was, he's been reading the Patrick O'Brien novels. Yeah, Patrick O'Brien's great. I, I love Patrick O'Brien's books. Um, <clears throat> there are so many books that you could find about Napoleonic Wars. Uh, one, the three that I would suggest are Jack Weller's books, uh, Wellington in India, Wellington in the Peninsula, and Wellington at Waterloo. Those are good, and they've got quite a good bibliography, which will lead you on to some other good books. But, I mean, you know, there are literally thousands of books about the Napoleonic Wars, so it's a bit difficult to give you, like, half a dozen particularly great ones, to be honest. Where did Napoleon keep his armies up his sleeves? Says John Hawking. Oh my God! Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. All right. So to to bring us a little bit, um, Osprey books are good for Napoleon campaigns. Yeah, I suppose they are. Um, that Napoleonic series that John Hawkins mentioned on YouTube is also not bad. I have watched most of those. Um, yeah. Uh, to bring us a little bit back to the book. Um, as I said, I, I think that uh, Charlie plainly doesn't especially like Israeli. Um, his main thesis uh, and, and the thing he supports and likes is the kind of country conservative party um, foreign policy, which was basically to do as little as possible whilst keeping the Royal Navy strong. Um, that's the thing he mostly supports all through the book. Uh, reading between the lines, and of course, as 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 we were saying before we went on air, um, the 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 um, the bad guy of the book is undoubtedly Gray, the, the Liberal Foreign Secretary, and I think quite correctly, to be honest. Um, as I said before, I I really want to concentrate uh, my bit of this on on sort of uh, the period from about eighteen ninety nine, or actually eighteen ninety six, I suppose, up to nineteen fourteen. And another thing that the book very clearly points out is that you, you would have you would go a long way to find a diplomacy more inept and crap than German diplomacy during that period, um, as regards the British particularly. Um, it's it's like uh, if uh, Germany could do something to piss Britain off in that period, they did it. Um, whether it was the Kruger telegram. Telegram when um, bloody uh, idiot uh, Dr. Jameson invaded the Transvaal, uh, which completely soured uh, British and German relations. And actually, that telegram was actually not as bad as the one he originally wanted to send to Kruger. It got toned down by some of the German diplomats, uh, but it was still enough to make most people in Britain pretty furious with the Germans. Um, and, ridic and it was ridiculous because, you know, the Germans couldn't even get forces to South Africa in the face of the Royal Navy had they wanted to. <clears throat> so there was that. Uh, and then, of course, the, the, the massive expansion in the German Navy from sort of um, the end of the 1890s onwards, which they didn't need. Um, there's a good book about it called The Luxury Fleet, because Germany was the most powerful military nation on Earth in sort of 1900 up to 1914. Um, she had relatively few overseas colonies, and she really didn't need a big navy. Whereas the Royal Navy, I mean, obviously Britain, first of all, itself is an island nation. And so therefore, you know, a navy was our first line of defense. Um, but also with the British Empire in those days, which was spread all over the world, it, the navy was absolutely essential to um, keeping that empire safe. And that includes not just, you know, all, all the little African and Asian countries and all, and, and even in India, but obviously the um, uh, white dominions in Canada and New Zealand and Australia and, and eventually in South Africa back then. Um, the Navy was absolutely essential to Britain. It was not essential to the Germans. And the fact that Germany was building one um, that was vastly superior to the two previous largest navies, which were the French and then the Russians, um, it was obviously aimed at Britain. It couldn't be aimed at anybody else. You know, as soon as Germany had a navy that was superior to that of the French, um, they didn't really need to build more ships unless they were aiming to um, uh, aiming at Britain. The Germans, of course, as the book makes fairly clear, were actually constantly hoping that the British would be friend into an, an alliance with them. 
whereas what the Germans did actually had the opposite effect for the most part. I don't know what you guys think about that. Well, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't help that uh, we wouldn't make any concessions to them in terms of like a non-aggression treaty or anything because we wanted to keep the options open. That doesn't exactly scream um, peaceful intentions. Um, I, I don't know. I, look, I, 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 the, the, the excuse, and I, I, I use the word excuse, the, the reason the British gave for not doing this is that the, the British really couldn't have peacetime alliances, and they didn't. The only time Britain, the first British peacetime alliance was the um, Anglo-Japanese Naval Agreement in 1902. And yeah, even, you... even Gray couldn't have an official alliance with the French and Russians. So, I mean, they had the Intentes, which were in many respects um, put the same obligations on the British, but without the advantages. But uh, even Gray couldn't go so far as having a military alliance with France or Russia. I mean, re regarding Germany's build-up, I mean, uh, Tarpitz's policy, which uh, to me always, see, uh, it, it, it's quite funny because it's basically asking for trouble uh, for the chat. Basically, Tarpitz, uh, the, the plan Tarpitz had was that the Navy would be big enough. It would never be Brit bigger than Britain's. He accepts this. But it would be big enough that if Britain and Germany faced a head-on battle, um, Britain would not be able to control the rest of her empire from other interested parties. And, uh, I mean, in what world is that sort of policy going to make Britain become friends with you? I... <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's just, Indeed. It, it's not a nice thing to do. Yeah. So... And it also didn't work either. I mean, you no, know, okay. as, as I, I, we, I, when I, we I, saw the First World War, um, there was only one huge naval battle in the First World War, which obviously was um, <clears throat> the, the Jutland in 1916. And um, Germany and the German admirals themselves and the Kaiser all realized that they had a very, very lucky escape. And they basically never came out in strength again. Mm. They, like they weren't, they were not enough German. One of the things I wanted to bring up was that you know people go on about this Anglo-German naval rivalry, but the Royal Navy and particularly the the then very efficient British shipyards had totally outbuilt the Germans by about 1910, 1911. You know, and Britain could, if she wanted to, lay down eight battleships a year at that time, and the Germans could never lay down more than two or three. Yeah, uh, uh, and you have you have these funny little uh, pieces of laws that Tarpitz creates, which is like it is legally required that these ships be built, mm. as if it makes them build any quicker. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Momo Kio in the chat is saying the Drakenfell made an excellent video about the Anglo-German naval arms race. Yes, he did. It's uh, it's actually on the Discord, boys. If you want to look at it. Um, but yeah, I, I'm a big fan of the Drug NFL. It's probably the best naval history channel on YouTube. I also like Alexander Cl Dr. Alexander Clark's naval channel as well, who is mates with Drug NFL anyway. But yeah, I, 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 the, the naval race was actually won well before World War One. Um, and you know, I've seen people try to say, Oh, yeah, Britain had to go to war in 1914 because of the German navy rivalry. Not true, Britain decisively won that naval arms race. And had we not gone to war in 1914 and stopped building new uh capital ships, new battleships and battle cruisers, um, the, the British lead over the Germans would just have got bigger and bigger. Yeah, because I, Britain I, would have always laid down four ships a year. It was never going to lay down less than that. And the Germans yeah. just couldn't do that. It's not a very convincing argument. And um, one of the things that um, goes through my brain is that, I mean, of course, after the war, you had um, less, than, uh, less than a decade later, you had the Washington Naval Treaties in which Britain and America was put one to one. And you, you can't help but wonder, like, if Britain hadn't gone into gone into that war, if one, it could have proceeded to outbuild Germany, which mm. it was um, going to do anyway, and it already had. And two, if it would have been a, a financial standing in which um, that naval treaty wouldn't have been required. No, um, it wouldn't. It, the, yeah. the, the treaty was, uh, the, look, the, even in 1918, Britain was nowhere near as skimmed in 1918 as we were in 1946. You know, yeah. nowhere near. 
Um, and uh, even then, Britain could have sustained a naval building race with the Yanks, um, but in 1918, you know, um, but they didn't want to, and it was it was it w- would have been very expensive. Um, mm. But there would have been no Washington Naval Treaty without World War One. I. I mean, that's certainly one of the things I'm going to bring up towards the end of this um, uh, stream when we look at the consequences. <clears throat> is, is, and they were entirely bad from Britain's point of view. Entirely bad. The Britain gained nothing from World War One. We got a rock, bro. <laughs> yeah, there was Britain. Britain gained a few pretty useless um, uh, League of Nations mandated territories, yes. More land to look after, yay! Yeah, <laughs> we and, finally, and, we finally and some, got the, and some uh, German colonies. For, yeah, we finally got the continuous um, uh, sovereign territory from uh, Cape, Cape to Cairo. Cairo. Yeah, yeah. Cairo, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what will we do with that Tanzania? Exactly. <laughs> yes, what are you going to do about Tanzania? Yeah. That fabulous yeah, German colony. Things. <laughs> you, you've got to, you've got, you've got to look. I mean, you've got to look at, um, uh, you know, the G- Germany came quite late to the colonial game, basically because Bismarck wasn't interested in it quite sensibly from Germany's point of view, um, and so the colonies they ended up with were the ones that most other people didn't want, uh, and, and one of them had a direct uh, thing with me because when I moved to South Africa, I ended up in the world's last colonial war in Southwest Africa, <laughs> which was originally German. That the South Africans took from the Germans in World War One. So, um, in fact, there was still a big German presence in in uh, Southwest Africa, and they make damn good beer as a result. But uh, yeah, um, it was uh, the German colonies were not mostly the best places, shall we say? Going back a tiny bit, though, um, I think it is worth saying that the. Uh, naval arms race justification for World War One does actually make some amount of sense if you assume that the uh, that Britain had a fairly rational policy of uh, first and foremost just defending the home islands um, via um, you know via the naval assets and via the navy. Yep. In which yep. case they would want to cut off a, th- a threat before it actually properly manifests itself and is properly able to you know become a an overwhelming existential threat. But one surprising thing that stuck out to me from the book was that, that doesn't seem to have been a concern. They were more concerned with trying to maintain relevance on the continent and considered the uh, the fact that they were functionally impervious already to whatever could, could be thrown at them. That, that was basically an afterthought most of the time. Um, I wouldn't say that was true under the Conservatives, um, and it wasn't even really true under the Liberals until um, 1905. I think it was grey in 1905, and like, you know, I, I, Tom, he's villain of the book, is grey. And uh, I totally agree with him, to be clear. I think he's entirely correct. Grey, grey like, was the, one of the people who made World War One happen, and he was the main person who made Britain involved in it, which was a total and absolute disaster for Britain and for the Empire. Yeah, that's that's definitely true of Gray. But uh, even before all of the, so you have Salisbury, obviously, who is who is cognizant of this fact that you know whatever happens, Britain is functionally impervious as long as the Royal Navy is strong enough. But all yeah. of the other people who are still pushing for some kind of intervention or greater entanglement elsewhere in the world, including people like Chamberlain, yeah. they are yeah. they're all um, not you know paying more attention to the strength of Britain's word and uh, how the, the extent to which they will be consulted on any great matter of the day or any. Uh, issues at, via conference, you know, considering themselves a good member of the uh, concert of Europe, rather than uh, sort of starting from that point of, okay, whatever happens in Europe doesn't actually concern us as much as the rest of Europe. Because for France, if something goes against them in Europe, then it's troops in their borders. Whereas for us, that's a bit difficult, a bit different. Yeah. All, all Britain needs to do, so long as the Navy is kept strong enough, and of course, one of the things that John Lee's book makes clear is that um, uh, certainly British conservative governments always kept the Navy strong. Um, you know, if, if if Britain looked a bit isolated, the natural conservative thing to do was build more ships. Um, because, you know, if the enemy can't land in your country, and not, not only uh, landing in the actual British Isles themselves, but of course, you know, going anywhere else around the empire, uh, <coughs> a Navy could be used to stop that. Uh, and it was perfectly possible for Britain's relatively small army, although let's be clear about this, the British army in even 1890 was vastly larger than it is today. <clears throat> um, uh, although it was tiny compared to most European armies and didn't have conscription. 
uh, an all-volunteer force, which of course made it very professional um, and uh, quite tough, particularly after the Anglo-Boer War. It taught the British Army quite a few good lessons about straight shooting, etc. Um, anyway, um, that army was always large enough to, to deal with any forces that were going to get past the Royal Navy, realistically. So I think, you know, you, you one, the book's called Splendid Isolation, and, and to some degree it was Splendid Isolation, so long as you kept the Royal Navy strong. And, and, you know, uh, one of the things Britain had back then was the two power standard, whereby the Royal Navy had to be kept larger than the next two largest navies, which at the time were France and Russia, put together. Because, you know, Britain might end up fighting France and Russia, so you had to have more ships than they did. And generally speaking, the British ships were also better and the crews were better trained. A bit, I did find it surprising that the... Uh... The splendid isolation, like yeah, you know, the titular splendid isolation, was not really so much deliberate policy as a, sort of an emergent quality of a mess of uh, foreign policy that had just kind of, kind of emerged out of events. I, I didn't actually get that. I got that it was the traditional British policy. Yeah, it I, was my, not my, to, not to have alliances in peacetime. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it might might not have been written down so to speak but there does seem to be sort of an unwritten sort of code that we don't make we don't pick sides um, yeah. we don't um so, uh, so, 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 Salisbury says throughout the book that you know um, what Britain's reaction would be to a war between Germany and France or Russia and Austria-Hungary etc would, would depend on the cause of spell line. It would depend on what caused the war and what was happening. And of course, he was quite right in that. Yes, but it wasn't much of his um, project to be trying to sort of pick up the pieces of uh, British prestige from the, uh, the Gladstonian government in combination with trying to find a, a set of allies that would be able, not, not allies is the wrong term, but uh, yeah. you know, associates who would be able to not entangle them in uh, continental concerns, but you know, still be able to protect them as as an alliance structure, which is basically like an alliance of uh, an alliance of the non-aligned almost. Um, Talking yeah, about I... uh, in particular Japan and the U.S. being the the two main uh, candidates for that. Well, the, the U.S. was never realistic. Um, they were never going to get involved in that because of the no, isolationist. But, but he went for it anyway. Oh, I don't think Salisbury did. Not at all. Sal Salisbury Sal didn't. Salisbury yeah, Sal didn't trust the Americans at all. Um, no, no. Salisbury, the, Salisbury was the um, was the prime minister who who mended relations with them with uh, with the Americans. That's well, when I, we... I don't necessarily agree with that. I mean, his his um, his uh, inclination over the uh, guffaw with America in in British Guyana was to tell the Americans to get stuffed. That was his inclination. He didn't, in the end, do that because the other nonsense was happening in South Africa, etc. But that was what he intended to do. Uh, and the British ambassador in the U.S., as is mentioned in Charlie's book, um, pointed out that the Americans were so jealous and, and um, decided that the, the Brits were evil that, the, that there was no point in even trying to do anything with America. And I think he was correct in that. I mean, you know, as, as late as World War Two, one of uh, FDR's war aims was the destruction of the British Empire, without doubt. Yes. Well, I, I would like to think that's true, but I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure at this point. I mean, I'll, I'll double check now and see what I can find if you wanted to move on. But uh... yeah, if you if you want to go and check it, you will find that when when that uh, Venezuelan, I think it was the Venezuelan crisis, supposedly. Um, came up out of a clear blue sky. Salisbury wanted to tell the Americans to get stuffed. He, he, that was his in, inclination. He had no interest in trying to negotiate with them. In the end, he agreed to do it because it because um, uh, Dr. Jameson, etc., was doing his nonsense in, in the Transvaal. So, but yeah, but yeah, I I, I think that the, the, you know the the the, the whole point of the book to me is that Salisbury was the last representative of the old country conservative party that was not against defense spending on the navy particularly but um, basically wanted to keep out of all European entanglements which was the sensible policy for Britain that's how Britain became rich and got a big empire around the world 
depending on the Navy and keeping out of European entanglements as much as possible. That was the traditional British policy. And even today, uh, and Churchill did this in, in the 1930s, and I'm no great huge Winston Churchill fan at all, <clears throat> but he, he did this and, and said, you know, oh, Britain's supposed to be there to keep the balance of power of Europe, but we should support the second most powerful country. Nonsense, that's not what Britain ever did until Grey came along in 1905 onwards. What, what Britain's policy was, was to try and be friends with everybody, not to be particularly enemies, and to sort out individual problems with individual negotiations about those particular problems, wherever they might be. Uh, and the closest Salisbury ever came to getting into any alliances was to be close to, but not join, with um, Austro-Hungary and Italy in, 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 in the Mediterranean. That was the closest he ever came to having an alliance. He was even against the Anglo-Japanese naval alliance, which was actually quite a good alliance, partly because it didn't require anyone to go to war when they were just fighting one nation and was basically a naval agreement. Initially, it got changed a bit later on, but initially it was a, it was a purely naval agreement. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I think to me that's like one of the central themes of the book is, is that, you know, Salisbury was the one of, in my opinion, Salisbury was the last uh, real conservative prime minister as far as I'm concerned. Um, but his, uh, everything he did was looking at uh, British interests. That was always what he looked at, first, second and last. Whereas you had people coming along like Gray later on who were genuinely interested in what happened to France. Salisbury didn't care if France got, got defeated. You know, Salisbury had been around in 1870-71 during the Franco-Prussian War. It made no difference to Britain that France got defeated. And, and uh, the other theme of the book that particularly is brought out, I think, in the conclusion, uh, is that um, the idea that Germany had this uh, idea of becoming, you know, sort of a superpower in Europe and running everything. And that's why Britain had to fight, fight Germany and support France. It's, it, again, it's bullshit. There's really no evidence for it. I mean, I think, it, I think had Britain not joined the war in 1914, um, France probably would have lost in, in 1915, most likely. Uh, and I don't think anything much worse would have happened than happened in 1870-71. You know, they would have charged the French an awful lot of money in, in reparations, and um, they might have taken a French colony or two. Well, why would that have bothered Britain? Yeah, the the, the, um, the general scope of World War I, I mean, w one thing you can say is that Germany being that powerful, I mean... Um, uh, so saying that they saying they took out both France and then had um, some gave some undevoted um, un, um, divided attention to Russia, then a power like that could have definitely been a problem for Britain. Um, but how, in, in a naval sense, which was the only thing that could damage Britain, was it, look, gaining. Even had they taken over all the French shipyards, which were vastly worse even than the German shipyards, by the way, and fewer of them, and they were smaller, um, even if they had been able to somehow or other occupy all, and use all the French shipyards, all the Russian ones, which had the same problem, <coughs> but and were in even more inaccessible places than the French one, um, uh, it wouldn't have made any difference. They couldn't have wrested naval supremacy from Britain. I mean, I, mean I, I, I agree that it's not worth going to war over, but I would, uh, but I would certainly prefer it if my nearest neighbors were divided as opposed to united, or under um, um, uh, under the rule of a hegemon, which Germany could have become post World War One. Um, I mean, so I guess that's I guess that's what I would say. I'm not saying that it's war worthy exactly. I'm just saying it's certainly not an ideal situation i mean the the economic downstream effects would probably be the the worst thing i mean the yeah. probably the nightmare scenario is to find themselves opposing another continental system but being even more reliant on um trade with europe which by that point they were and so it would be even more difficult to uh sort of make up the difference <coughs> elsewhere in terms of uh trade and incomes 
well, this this will bring us on in a minute to um, talking about imperial tariff preference, which is not something the book goes on about, but it's something I've read quite a lot about, uh, and I think is one of the overlooked things. So that, that will come into this discussion in a bit. Um, I'm not pushing on as fast as I might because I'm still thinking Adam might join us because he said he would, so we'll see. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, it's... Uh, I, to me, the idea that Germany could permanently occupy all of France in the way that she did in World War II, for example, is in, in 14, 15, 17, 18. Not, it was never going to happen. It just wasn't going to happen. Oh, yeah, no, that's not the, uh, that's not the threat. The threat is that they just um, hollow out the French economy to the extent that it, it can no longer trade properly with... Uh, with the UK and potentially falls into a German economic sphere um, to the, to well, the detriment I mean, of British trade. If Even if that happened, then I find that very unlikely because, you know, if the, if the French had got beaten again in 1915 as they were in 1870, 71, um, I, that's not going to endear the Germans to the French. Um, the Germans, actually, one of the things the book does point out, by the way, is that the Germans, uh, long prior to World War One had said that they would not um, annex any more French territory. You know, they took up Sass Lorraine in 1870-71, but I mean, you know, those places were as German as they were French anyway, really. Well, not not even, exactly. So... They're German, really. Well, North, Northern mm. Lorraine. Northern mm. Lorraine is uh, definitely yeah. French, but uh, Alsace was never treated as... The Alsatians themselves were never treated as... Um, like proper Germans, they were always treated with suspicion. Yeah, I mean, there's, they a were. There's, there's a reason the Alsatian dog is the German shepherd dog. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I mean, to the point that uh, they were legally discriminated against, as I recall, and they were treated as, um, so despite the fact that they spoke German and they were strictly speaking ethnically German, they, yeah. there was a much less um, cultural affinity between those, between those two groups than you might imagine. Yeah, I mean, you, you could say the same thing about Corsica, which, you know, is, is, is probably more Italian than it is French, even though that's where Napoleon came from. Yeah, I, I mean, the thing that strikes my head would some, be something like the Walloons and Germany proper. Mm. But, um, yeah. I mean, don't, don't, don't forget, even had, uh, even had France been totally drawn into the German orbit, which, as I say, I, I don't think is very likely, but had that happened, um, the Netherlands weren't involved in the war. The Scandinavian countries weren't involved in the war. Um, Spain and Portugal weren't. Um, yeah, there, there were still plenty of European places that Britain could trade with. Yeah, but these aren't big economies. Yeah, and... no, they're not. They're not as big. But I mean, also Britain had quite a considerable trade with Germany, and the, you know, the, the, it, had Britain not gone to war in 1940, and I don't think the German-British trade would have stopped. Well, it, no, but this is the problem that. with, with, hege with this is the problem with uh, them having some amount of hegemony. If they start trying to throw their weight around and use uh, the possibility of some kind of either tariffs or a um, you know a boycott on British goods or something as as like a, a bargaining tool, then uh, oh, so you're, you're, not you're, in very good. It's, it's you're, not in a very strong position to sort of resist. So you're talking about something along the lines of Napoleon's continental system. Yes, yes, that, uh, yeah, I specifically said that, which, which totally failed. It, it, Even when Napoleon occupied far more territory than the Germans were ever likely to, and was friends with Russia at the time, which the Germans were also not going to be. Yes, it did, but by that point, so by, um, well, you know, 100 years in the future, um, Britain was a lot more reliant on trade than they were uh, in, uh, well, okay, they could feed themselves during the Napoleonic era, as I recall, whereas they could, they would not even close to doing that by the time you get to World War yeah, but, I. And anything but, beyond but, that would be the same problem. But don't forget, Britain also had like three quarters of all the merchant ships in the world in 1940. Yes, no, but they still relied on um, predominantly trade from Europe. You know, but, we didn't, the... but we didn't have to. It would have been quite easy for Britain to shift its uh, trade to America and to the self governing white dominions, which is one of the things that's going to I come mean, on. Uh, we're going to go to war about. over over trade concessions in uh, in China. I think we were just trying to basically hoover up as much trade as we possibly could. So well, losing Britain was such always a start... Britain was yeah. always trying to do that, absolutely, and it was a good policy. Okay, but this is going to this is going to tr trigger a very very nasty economic recession. Is the thing. 
I don't think it would have, to be honest. I really don't. I mean, what, what, one of the things that uh, to me is, is, is glaring is that in 1913, Britain was still the richest nation in the world. We weren't necessarily the top steel producer or the top coal producer anymore, but we were still the richest nation by a considerable margin in 1913, and we most certainly weren't in 1919. Partly, of course, because the whole of World War One, or you know, the Americans joined World War One in 1917 because it suited them and it was nearly finished, um, but. Uh, the Americans spent the vast majority of World War One making a huge amount of money and expanding their industry because they were supplying the the um, nations who were fighting. Yes. So without that, that wouldn't have happened. But it, 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 given Britain's enormous merchant fleet and the fact that the Royal Navy was fully able to protect it, um, even from someone like Germany who had a relatively large navy, um, you know, all German squadrons outside the Baltic were basically swept from the sea before the end of 1914. Um, so, <laughs> and, and I think that a sensible policy for Britain in 1914 would have been an armed neutrality in the North Sea, whereby the Royal Navy said, well, look, you know, if you come out and you're trying to go and attack France or something like that with your naval forces, then we're not going to let you do that. But other than that, we're not involved. We're neutral. And I think that would have been the sensible British policy. And I, I don't see, I, I, as I said, I think that Germany would have won in 1915, probably. I don't think they would have necessarily won in 1914, but in 1915, they certainly would have, in my opinion. <laughs> and um, you would have got some sort of negotiated peace. Um, they would have taken a lot of money off the French. They might have taken one or two French colonies. And like I said, none of that need to, needed to concern Britain whatsoever. I mean, even that would potentially still trigger a recession in, uh, well, quite a lot of the global economy, I suspect. I think it did I'm, in... Um, I'm not sure it would, because it didn't happen in 1870. I think it did, actually, yeah. No, there was, there was a recession in the late 1870s, but I'm not sure that that was at all related to the franco prussian War, to be honest. There, there, there yeah, was not it, there was not a recession in like 1873 1874 1875 the, the recession was around 1877 onwards yes but it was preceded by a financial crisis as i recall because there was a massive devaluation of a lot of uh, assets that france had to uh you know sell on mass essentially just to, just to raise the funds yeah sure but i as I say it, it, i'm not sure that that recession in 1877 onwards I'm not sure that that was really um, related to the franco prussian War, to be honest. I think it'd be difficult to tie it to that because it was so many years later. Yeah, um, speaking um, from an economics point of view, the effect that trade, like in abundant, like trade in aggregate plays in recessions is not as big as you would expect. And this is why Britain hasn't had like some chaotic Brexit recession. It's because trade is just at the end of the day, it's not that important. Um, you can. Uh, it's also interesting, interestingly, why uh, Africa's growth for the past 20 years doesn't really count for much. It's because trade doesn't really get you anything in and of itself. What really matters is um, productivity and human capital. And Britain would have still had that. Um, the main issue I foresee is that if you have an equally dominant power on the continent, um, you just don't know what tricks they can pull 10 years down the line or something like that. That's just, that would be my main concern with the German victory in World War One. I. I think Steve makes a. I th sorry to interrupt you, uh, George. I'll uh, let you finish in a sec. I just think that Steve's made a good point in the chat. That even a recession would have been cheaper than a major war in in both blood and treasure. Oh, yeah, that, that, that's that's no, what we know now. Yes, but but it, it like looking at it from the perspective of a government that's never really known anything like a major war or anything more than a fairly limited war, uh, deploying the navy for a little bit to avoid German economic hegemony in Europe is a pretty small price to pay. If that's what they'd done, I would even agree with you. Yeah, 
And I suspect, and I've been given every reason to believe that that's exactly what they expected the outcome to be, rather but, than but, what it turned out to be. They almost immediately, I mean, all right, first of all, yeah, you've got to look that... you, Sorry, carry on. No, no, I was just saying, doesn't that beg the question why the British Expeditionary Force was sent in as soon as, almost as soon as Britain entered the war? Well, because they'd already agreed to do that. Yeah, this this is what I was just going to come on to. Gray was extremely politically dishonest. Um, he was allowing uh, Anglo-French military talks uh, long before there was even an entente with France, really. Uh, and he was lying to the Prime Minister about it. Gray was the Foreign Secretary, obviously. And he was outright lying to the Prime Minister about this. And I mean, the mere fact that Britain, which had a small army that is always best designed to be a projectile fired by the Royal Navy, to be honest, which I totally agree with. That was one of Fisher's sayings. Um, and I still agree with that today. Um, the, 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 the mere fact that these talks were between military British army guys and the British army was not that important to British defense, really, <coughs> relatively speaking. Um, shows what nonsense it was. And the French, because, you know, the French are not damn stupid, they immediately said, if there's a war between Britain and France, the best thing Britain can do is send even one or two divisions to France because they knew if they could drag Britain in there, Britain would inevitably have to expand those forces. They knew this. And, and uh, you know, Germany uh, didn't win World War I because Britain, basically, and I, I'm not one of these people. That I, I, look, I think the Kaiser was inept. I don't think he was the brightest tool in the shed, but I don't think that there is any, um, there is any sort of um, relationship between what the Kaiser wanted and, and, and the Wilhelmine German Empire and the later uh, moustache guy, who's known as the Austrian painter. There was, they weren't the same sort of people at all. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, that's possibly one of Max Hastings' most bizarre things. He's yes, said. yeah. <laughs> it's just, um, yeah. yeah. Um, listen, I, I like Max Hastings. When he was the editor of The Telegraph, he once gave me um, two whole pages in The Telegraph for some military history tours I was what, running many, many, many moons ago. Um, but yeah, his stuff on the first world war is bullshit, frankly. It really is. Yeah, it was always that. That would, I mean, I saw that debate on, I think it was, I think it was, uh, it's on YouTube, it's on YouTube as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it, um, but the, the channel is like Intelligence Squared, and yes. it's just like, um, I personally find it very, it's it's very much like TED Talks. It's very kind of, it's, it's very that self kind of level. That, yeah, to say that oh kind yes of level. oh yes we're having a debate on Intelligence Squared, mm. um, but um, he he comes off and says that like the Kaiser Kaiser Wilhelm was just uh, like reading about him. He seems like a bit of a spoiled child. Yeah, but apart from that, he's just he's I mean he's not like trying to conquer the world he doesn't he doesn't have the bizarre um socialist and ideological tendencies of Adolf hitler like he's just a funny man <laughs> he's just a funny man with a withered arm yeah um, that yeah. wanted his country to do well um yeah. so yeah I, I totally agree with that I, I he wasn't evil you know no he, yeah. he was he was not going to be setting up death camps anywhere or anything of that nature that was not his style I, I, although you you might know this, I mean, I I I don't. Do you know what extent he had a part in playing in um, the Namibian um, German funny business around? The oh, the, Ger the Germans were um, always, even during the Franco-Prussian War. The, the the Germans were much more ruthless than the British ever were. You know, one one of the things that uh, British people got very annoyed about during the anglo boer War is the Germans saying that the Brits were barbarous in South Africa when we were nowhere near as bloody barbarous as the Germans almost always were. So, you know. well, well, yes, I mean, I, I mean, people can look up what the Germans did in Namibia, but like the, the, the question would be is that like, did the Kaiser know 
What was happening there? He may, he, he may have done, but I'm sure you know he didn't run it day to day. But yeah. like I said, the Germans were always more ruthless than the Brits. I mean, if you look at what the Germans did to what they called Frank Tireurs, which were basically guerrilla fighters or resistance fighters, not in uniform in the, in the Franco-Prussian War, they were ruthless with those guys even then. You know, if they caught them, they shot them. <coughs> yeah, the, the, yeah. German colonization was a pretty nasty piece of work, as to be said. So, well, look, the the reason they got the nickname Huns, which was used very often in the First World War, was because when the uh, Germans were sending this huge force to China for the Boxer Rebellion, which the British were also involved in and all sorts of other people, um, which mostly arrived too late to take part in the fighting, you know, typical Germans. Um, but uh, uh, it, it, uh, he, he, the Kaiser said to the German soldiers that they needed to behave like Huns. That's how they got that nickname. I mean, so. it has to be said, I, I always found it very funny. It's like, surely you would call the Austrian Hungarians. Uh, it's, even, it's in the name, um, yeah. the Huns. But I, I guess that gives it some context. Yeah, but th that's that's where that nickname came from. It was when those forces were being sent to, to China. And as I said, most of them arrived too late to do any fighting. And <laughs> just went back to Germany again. Um, but uh, he told them to behave like Huns. And so the German name would always be remembered in China as ruthless and blur and blur and blur. You know? um, mm -hmm. But that was just the Kaiser. He he was that bombastic sort of twat, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he was also, um, look, look, he was Queen Victoria's uh, nephew, I believe. Um, like he was the son of one of Queen Victoria's daughters. Um, yeah, grand nephew. Yeah, um, grand, great, grand great nephew. nephew yeah. yeah, yeah. But he he was always jealous of the Royal Navy, for example, which is one of the reasons why he was so keen on German naval expansion. Not realizing that, like, if you want the British to be your enemy, the one thing you could do in in sort of eighteen ninety five was expand your navy. Actually, hold on a second. Uh, he would have been her great grandson because her eldest, Victoria, married um, Frederick. Frederick. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, so yeah, grandson. grandson. Grandson sounds right. Actually, now. I yeah. Think about it. yeah. 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 Um, um, Rupert, what? What? You, you got anything to add on the, this aspect of stuff? Um. I mean, one little tidbit is that, uh, from what I've heard, I mean, I don't necessarily believe this, but it's an interesting idea. The Japanese got got a lot of their um, disposition towards occupation from the uh, German style of military discipline. Well, the Japanese were, 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 were despite if you, if anyone's watched the last samurai, you 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 get the impression that America had a lot to do with the Japanese army, which it never did. Absolute bullshit. <laughs> it's not a bad movie, but it's crap. Um, and um, uh, in fact, the, the, the Japanese army originally was trained by the French. Uh, and if you look at early Japanese uniforms, like uh, when I say early, I'm talking about uh, late 19th century Japanese uniforms and early 20th century. They're, they're full of um, uh, French knots and all the rest of it on their uniform. And they wore kind of kepi like hats and all the rest of it because of the French influence. Early on, um, yes, but after the resolution of the Franco-Prussian War, they switched over to uh, trying to get advisors from Prussia, well, Germany instead. Well, no, I think it was later than that, mate, to be honest. Um, the, the, the French were, like, the, the Meiji Restoration was, what, 1877-ish? 1877, something around then? No, I thought it was a bit earlier. Yeah, I was thinking it was. It was definitely a hard switch when they. Uh, yeah, and I, no, think, it, you know, I think it was the like 1868. Was it 1868? Have you looked yeah. that up, mate? Yeah, all right, cool. Yeah. I thought it was later than that, but fair enough. But yeah, now originally they they were influenced by the French. Um, they probably did change after the Franco-Prussian War because, for example, um, the Americans had favoured um, French stuff prior to the Franco-Prussian War. If you look at the um, American uniforms in the American Civil War, you'll see they're wearing kepi-like hats. And uh, uh, both the Confederates and the Union forces have big French knots on their officers' uniforms and all this kind of stuff. Um, so they favored the French. But then pr after the Franco-Prussian War, the Americans adopted as full-dress uniform 
a version of the pickle harp, so, which you will occasionally see if you look for pictures. They didn't wear them in the field, but on parade they did. Um, so, yeah, um, a lot of nations switch from the French to the Germans after the Franco-Prussian War because nothing succeeds like success, you know? Yeah. Um, the British, to, uh, the British like... even, the, the British kind of did the same sort of thing as well. If you look at British uniforms in the um, uh, early 1870s, they, they were uh, a bit more French-like. The British Charco was not a kepi, but it was kind of a bit like one. But then we adopted the the um, spiked helmet, which actually wasn't a copy of the pickle harp, but it was somewhat resembling it, I suppose. So, you know, um, <clears throat> again, for full dress, it wasn't really worn in action. Um, but yeah, uh, a, a lot of countries did that. But initially, it was the, the French and then, as you say, the Germans that trained the Japanese army, uh, whereas their navy was always trained by the Brits. And one of the worst aspects of the Washington Naval Treaty in, in the 1920s was the fact that the Americans insisted that the British get rid of the Anglo-Japanese um, alliance because they were scared that the Japanese and British between them could, would have much more powerful naval forces than they had or were allowed under the tree. Uh, and of course, the, the Japanese were mortally offended by this because it had been an alliance that they'd had for 20 years. And it was their only alliance as well. And by the time of World War One, the alliance was more than naval because in after the um, the Russo-Japanese War in 1904-5, um, it was extended uh, to the extent that Britain agreed to send troops to Korea if um, Russia attacked it, and um, Japan uh, even said that they would send divisions to British India if Russia attacked it. So it became a very important alliance for the Japanese and, and Britain just ditching it in 1922 after World War One, of course, um, really offended them, um, which came home to roost in um, uh, late 1941 and 1942 for the Brits. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry, I'm looking at something that uh, Rupert sent me in the chat. I'm just checking it out. Oh, well, might as well bring it up then. Just um, yeah, the, the period of um, US, uh, UK sort of um, mending of relations in the 19th mm, century is called yes. the Great Reproachment. And I, I know that based on what, uh, like the, the way that uh, some of these diplomatic interactions are actually playing out, you would think that it, it sounds like a souring of relations, but. Um, yeah, the actual results at the end of it are, are quite different. So I, I kind of read it as the, uh, I guess the the special relationship um, prequel edition, almost. <laughs> uh, where the let, me, let, me, let me vomit the word yeah. special relationship, but yeah, okay. oh, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but, um, the the Americans abuse British interests, and uh, and we're fond of them nonetheless. Oh look, I I think the real. Um, the real reason that happened was that in 1898, when uh, America went to war with Spain over largely trumped up charges that the Spanish blew up an American battleship, the Maine, in, in um, Cuba, I think. Which Wasn't they that being confirmed as a false flag now? Yeah, it was nonsense. It was it was I've, it was probably an accident, to be honest. The Spanish certainly didn't do it, but it was probably an accident. But um, the, the real reason that French, uh, sorry, Anglo-American relations got a bit bad then was in 1898, uh, the only European power that actually could have said to the Americans, no, you can't do this, would have been Britain because the Royal Navy was vastly bigger than the American Navy at the time. Uh, and we didn't. We, 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 re, we were the only European power that didn't back the Spanish. Yeah. And as a result of that, during the Anglo-Boer War, when many Irish Americans and other people wanted the Americans to be um, anti-British, they weren't because they remembered that the Brits weren't anti-American during the Spanish-American War. So um, I think that was the, the real thing when that happened. But um, it didn't really continue for long. Well, but I, mean, I think there were uh, elites on both sides who were trying to uh, push this idea of a kind of yeah, yeah. Anglosphere Union. 
the, the British the, 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 the British ones that did, like Winston Churchill, for example, who had an American mother, um, and um, Chamberlain. I, like Joe Chamberlain, I like in some respects and not in others, but Joe Chamberlain had an American wife, you know. Uh, oh, I don't just mean I don't just mean in government. I mean outside of government as well. I'm not sure there was much of a push for it, to be honest with you. The, realistically, politically, no, nah, I don't think there was really on either side of the Atlantic. I, the, the Americans were much too isolationist to to become involved with anyone. I mean, you know, the, one of the things I've often said about the what the Washington Naval Treaty is that. What the British should have said to the Americans was, well, look, if you want us to give up the Anglo-Japanese Naval Alliance, then give us an alliance to replace it. And if you don't, we won't. Well, no, this is a, this is a period of where America is trying to reach out. I mean, this is why they had uh, Puerto Rico and the Philippines. You, oh, you're losing me a bit there, mate. How? How, how is that them reaching out? It, well, because I mean, they, they, they were trying they, to, they 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 were trying the, to go for the push. Yeah. Under people like Teddy Roosevelt. Who ex explicitly? Oh yeah, yeah. Campaign. All right, Ro Roosevelt. I think yeah, the Great White Fleet and all this crap. But yeah, um, I mean, they did have they did have a jingoistic movement, and uh, yeah, they did, they did, and, and it was kind of a similar was situation. Writing is take up the white man's burden and stuff at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, and but, by rights, uh, one of the interventionists should have been in charge um, over the course of the, well, at the outset of uh, World War One, but the vote was split. So it ended up being the outside bet in the uh, in the form of Wilson, who, uh, who actually got in. Otherwise, he was the, he was, he was third down the list, I think, in, in terms of, no, no, he wasn't. It was, uh, I think, I think he was second, mm. but um, Teddy Roosevelt running the Bull Moose Party ended up splitting the, splitting the progressive vote, which was otherwise completely dominant. Yeah. Fair, fair enough, but as I say, I, d I don't think an, an Anglo-American alliance was ever realistic in, in the early 20th century, to be honest. I mean, even when they joined World War One, they weren't prepared to become allies. They became co-belligerents. Yes. Um, Mine Webb in the chat said, Brit the British supplied the ships that Japan used to thrash the Russians. Well, they, they certainly supplied the designs and some of the ships. Uh, in fact, the, the Japanese flagship at Tsushima, uh, where they thrashed the Russian um, fleet that had sailed all the way around the world from the Baltic, um, was built by the British. And that's still in Japan. You can go and visit it. It's a preserved warship and a museum ship. Um, but they, yeah, the British did supply some of the ships. Uh, they supplied most of the ship designs, and they certainly supplied a lot of the training, too. So, you know, the, the Japanese Navy was very good, partly because it was trained by the Royal Navy. So yeah, like lots of Japanese admirals, etc., went to uh, the Royal Navy College of Dartmouth and this kind of stuff. So to some degree, Martin Webb, I agree with you. Uh, and you know, J Russia in those days was certainly a British enemy, and with some reason, as we discussed earlier. So yeah. Um, Steve in the chat says a lot of Americans, hang on, let me put this up so people can read it. Uh, a lot of Americans were comfortable with the idea of an overseas alliance, especially after the Philippines insurgency. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, um, I, I know that, uh, what's his name, that very young kid uh, who gets in AA's chat a lot, he's done some stuff with Radlib on, on like American overseas colonies, including stuff they got from the Spanish American War. That is quite interesting. So yeah, uh, but yeah, I, I I think you can realistically look at uh, an American war aim, even in World War Two, was the destruction of the British Empire. Definitely was. And a book that you should read about that, which is another book I might do one of these streams on, is the Last Thousand Days of the British Empire, which is well worth reading if you haven't read it. So, would you say that, um, I mean, it's slightly related to the topic of the stream, I suppose, um, given Britain's circumstances in 1939, should we have offered Poland, um, should we have declared war with Germany over Poland? No, I wouldn't have. I mean, basically what Chamberlain did after the mess up of, of um, you know, 
was to uh, give the Polish a great big red war button for Britain, which they could push any time they liked. It was stupid. It was nonsense politics. Because Britain couldn't materially aid Poland. We knew that. We look. The, 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 there's a big difference in Britain in in 1938 and 1939, and Britain in 1913 and 1914. Britain in 1913 and 1914 was immeasurably richer and more powerful. Um, yeah, um, but in principle, I mean, Germ I mean, Germany in 1939 had obvious. I mean, far more than Kaiser Wilhelm continental aspirations and. Hitler did propose to outbuild Britain navally eventually, which. But he couldn't. Well, uh, I mean, let, let's suppose for he, example. He literally couldn't. Plan Z was a fantasy. Yeah, uh, so suppose for an example. I mean, it is probably possibly a bit far out there, but Hitler did take out, say, Russia and um, all the rest of that. Russian and, shipyards in 1939, 1940, 1941 were even worse than they were well, in 1940. Well, it's not entirely about the shipyards at this point because it's also about resources and it's about money and it's about manpower. And it, I mean, I could foresee a circumstance, particularly with Germany in 1939, in which you would not want them to be too powerful, more, much more so than, say, um, Kaiser Wilhelm. I, um, I, 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 yeah, I mean, I don't disagree with the that that part of what you say there, uh, George. But um, uh, Britain could not aid Poland in 1939, and uh, Chamberlain had been told by his experts, both financial and military and naval, that Britain could not win a short war because we had to rely on blockade. And we didn't have the money in 1939 for a long war. We would go bankrupt, as, is, as indeed Britain did in 1942. Mm. You, you know, the, the Americans sent a cruiser to Cape Town to collect the very last of the British gold reserves at some point in 1942. And it was only after that that they agreed to lend lease stuff, which, of course, was not giving Britain aid. It was giving Britain aid that she would pay for later. Well, ultimately, all that they needed to do was to give France the assurances and the materials potentially that they, that, that they would need to conduct any kind of offensive because the border was basically unguarded. Uh, hang on, you, you, what, what, you're talking about 39 now? Or? Yes, 39, 39. Um, but and the not French, dissuade the, but the, Poland from, from mobilizing because they were they were slightly dissuaded from mobilizing, so they never actually were able to bring their full force to bear, which would have been quite but, considerable. Yeah, and it was also very outdated. But I mean, also, the, the French had made it very clear that they weren't really going to attack the Germans. Like, I mean, I, I believe they did launch a, a very limited offensive. South German... offensive. Yeah, which, which yeah, they, like, I think they went about 12 miles in, into Germany and very quickly retreated. As soon as as soon as they hit a pinprick, they decided that it was a bit too much and went home. Um, yeah, no, I don't think they uh, even uh, encountered any meaningful resistance. They they just turned around and went home. Yeah, they, 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 were they got, they got snipers piece, but... and machine gunners firing at them, and they may have lost a tank or two. But basically, the French were not interested in attacking at all. Like the French losses in World War, the, to me, like the the, the French performance in nineteen. 39-40 is the result of Verdun. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, actually, what, and what people fail to remember now is that the G French army had huge mutinies in 1917, and I mean very, very large mutinies, so that even for, for the rest of the war, the French army could only do certain things. It had to be handled very, very, very carefully it, it, for the rest of 1917 and 1918 because okay. they would just mutiny and refuse to fight. There's a but very there's good another... video um, by Ryan Falk, uh, actually, in which she basically did a huge defense of France's conduct in World War II. And it's actually a very, very interesting watch. Uh, for those who are interested, it's some bit, bit shoot. Oh, I do recommend. I think I think I've seen it actually, George. Yeah. Well, most of his stuff's worth a watch, even when you don't totally agree with it. Yeah. I mean, the the other issue though is that they didn't. So they deliberately consigned themselves to that kind of performance due to a fear of professional uh, military units that would spend too 
too long in proximity to, to their generals. So although they were quite aware of um, various doctrinal developments when it came to uh, mechanized armored units, because they were because they were considered too professionalized and they were and when it was being proposed to the government, it was proposed in terms that um, were um, politically contentious and made the uh, the civilian government very jittery. Um, those efforts were deliber deliberately um, foiled and, and hamstrung by the civilian government because they thought that it was um, creating a tool that would be would be used to coup them. Um, you also, I think, one of the, one of the other things that gets forgotten a lot today is that in France and also to some degree in Britain, it has to be said, that the the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, which basically made Stalin's Russia and, and Hitler's um, Germany allies. Um, meant that the, the, the communist supporters in France, where they were more common, but also those in Britain, and that includes many socialist so-called labor supporters, were very reluctant to like increase production of war materials and all this kind of stuff. They didn't want to do it because Hitler was an ally of their mate Stalin. And, and this is very often overlooked today. Mm. You know, I mean, Poland itself was divided between Stalin's Soviets and, and Russia's Nazis. Uh, sorry, Germany's Nazis. So, you know, it, it, they were allies at that stage, basically. Um, it, it's uh, This is one of the reasons why you get all this confusion of the, with what the Japanese are doing in the Far East is because the, the Japanese were sitting there scratching their heads because they were uh, supposedly allies of the Germans and there were the Germans allying with Stalin. So, you know, it was, uh, and that went on for quite a long time. I mean, it was only uh, Barbarossa in, in um, not, what was it, June, July 1941 that um, ended it. Um, that, that, yeah, there's, um, I, I want one historian, I can't remember his name, but uh, he, he, he gave the proposition. It was quite an interesting proposition, it has to be said, that if, um, if Britain didn't invade Norway in 1940 mm -hmm. uh, with the invasion of Narberg, um, no, not Britain, uh, if Germany didn't invade Norway, um, um, then uh, Britain <laughs> might have invaded Norway and then used it to bomb Russia. <laughs> um, uh, yes, Britain Britain did also in, uh, violate Norway's sovereignty the, yeah. due to the yeah. exact timeline. I mean, it gets, yeah. it gets muddled because it's by a matter of days but yeah that did happen uh, yeah but had we, had we done it a couple of days earlier we might have done even better although it has to be said that the british with some help from the norwegians actually sank about a third of the german navy in the norwegian campaign yeah but which, um, is, which was a reason that sea lion was never a practical proposition even if it had been when germany had their full fleet in 1939 which was tiny compared to the royal navy Um, you know, the, the Royal Navy was the only bit of the British forces, which in 1938 was absolutely ready to go to war. Hmm. I mean, uh, it wasn't as ready as it would have been in 1942, but it was pretty ready. Well, that I mean, that comes from the uh, the construct of how navies work. Um, and the, fact really... that the Royal Navy was the major yeah. British armed force. You, you can't really mobilize a navy normally. You. Uh, um, you can't train a bunch of ships, so to speak. You can not, uh, not quickly enough. No. Yeah, you you can. I mean, aircraft you can produce somewhat quicker, and you can train. You know, um, a reasonable amount of men, uh, depending the, on the amount the, of the, the Brits. Historically, the Brits. actually, that's not the case, and uh, potentially the Ankapistan Navy would uh, would follow off the same lines of uh, drafting in merchant vessels and strapping some guns to them. Yeah, but, well, it, yeah. Wouldn't work. it wouldn't work. <laughs> <laughs> It would not work. But yeah, look, the Brits in World War II could build uh, something from a destroyer downwards in about a year um, or a bit less. But uh, a cruiser took a couple of years and a battleship took three years. But if you'd have gone back to 1913, Britain could build all those ships at least twice as fast. Yeah. We, we, we'd lost the ability to do so, partly because... The Washington and then, then the later naval London Treaty, which stopped the building of battleships for any major nations, apart from um, Rodney and uh, Nelson for, for the Brits in 22. Um, 
It meant that by 1939, Britain didn't have anywhere near as many shipyards capable of building big ships and didn't have as many skilled tradesmen to build them as quickly as they needed to. But people forget that in, in 1913, 1914, Britain could build a battleship in under a year if she wanted to, as she did with HMS Dreadnought. Which no other country in the world could even come close to. Everyone else would take over two years to do the same thing. British shipyards were easily the best and most efficient shipyards in the world, and we didn't just build ships for the Brits. Um, as someone pointed out in the chat earlier, we built ships for the Japanese, but we built ships for loads of nations, you know, South American navies and all sorts of people. Um, and British shipyards were easily the best and most efficient in the world, and we could build warships twice as fast as anyone else could, and that included the Americans at the time. By 1939, that was no longer true because, like I say, the, the Washington and then the later London Naval Treaties, um, I, there wasn't enough business to keep these shipyards going, to keep the large ones that could build battleships and battle cruisers and aircraft carriers going. And uh, particularly, there, there wasn't enough skilled manpower anymore because we weren't building enough bloody ships to keep it. Um, one of the problems that Britain has to this very day is that, like we, we mostly build warships these days, um, but we don't build enough to keep the amount of skilled manpower that you need to keep that going. You know, you have to keep a steady drumbeat of building ships in order to build that manpower up. And the more you build that manpower up, uh, and these days, of course, it includes computer engineers and all sorts of people, not just guys who actually deal with steel and stuff, but you need those too. And, and to build that up, you need to build enough ships, and we don't which is one of the problems we still have today. But I, I feel like we've drifted a long way from this book at the moment. <laughs> so um, I, 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 to, to bring it a little bit back to the book, <clears throat> um, I, I think one of the things that happens that is it's mentioned in the book, but it isn't covered heavily, but I've read quite a lot about it in other places. Um, it was Joseph Chamberlain, and as I say, I have some problems with Joseph Chamberlain, but on, the, I, this, on this, I think he was correct. Um, Joseph Chamberlain wanted to bring in a thing called imperial tariff preference, which what that would have basically meant was that goods coming to Britain from Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa back then, although also from other places in the empire, but mainly from, from the white dominions, <coughs> uh, would have got um, less, they, they, they would have been cheaper for, Brit for British people to buy than goods coming from, say, America or from Europe. And um, the object of this was to try and turn the old Commonwealth, and the old Commonwealth, as I say, is Great Britain plus Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and back then South Africa, uh, was to turn the old Commonwealth from something more than just a, a sentimental att attachment. And I think it's something we should have supported. Um, it was the occasion for Winston Churchill, who, as I say, I'm not a big fan of that war, um, for him to leave the Conservative Party, cross the floor, and join the Liberals, um, you know, which was kind of typical for him, in my opinion. <clears throat> and I don't think Winston Churchill actually was very fond of the, the, the old um, white dominions, to be honest, <coughs> certainly going by his behavior in World War II. But anyway. <coughs> um, yeah, um, that was another thing that happened around this time. This was uh, uh, the big thing of the 1908 election. And to me, that was the last chance to try and turn the, 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 the old Commonwealth into something a bit more um, solid than merely, you know, the same queen and this kind of fact. I don't know what you guys think about that stuff. Um, I mean... It's a belief of mine that um, it could be erroneous, but um, it's a belief of mine that I don't think any sort of serious political formation can ever be made of um, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Britain, and that. And I believe that's simply because of political distance. Um, I, there is a certain point at which nations with big enough populations, like particularly particularly to my mind, Australia and Britain, 
in which they're so far apart in which even politically pro probably even today such a such a union would not be feasible well, I, I, listen I'm, I'm not really talking about a union you know I'm not talking about necessarily one government with an imperial parliament although there were people back then who certainly did think about that um, like today I'm a council supporter if we could get rid of the huge amount of pause in all four countries you know yeah. I mean <laughs> what would a Kansas look like though because I think it, I think it would be a naval and military alliance for the most part and obviously like free trade a free trade area I guess so basically NATO but Anglo yeah yeah something like that uh, I mean look even today let's be clear about one thing for example both Canada and Australia are buying um, although they're going to build them themselves, they're buying the latest British frigate design. But Canada and Australia are already doing that, and on New Zealand would if it could afford them, which it can't at the moment because they've got that horse-faced feminist socialist in charge of them. But um, so that's happening. You've also recently seen um, Australia join the Brits and the Yanks uh, with the idea of building nuclear subs. So. Uh, the, the military side of that is, is, is by no means stupid. And it's worth pointing out that even today, with no growth in the forces, a, a Kansas naval alliance would be easily the second naval power in the world after the Americans. It'd be far bigger than Russia, and it would actually be a little bit bigger than China. Or a little bit more powerful than China, shall we say. I mean, I, I mean China's navy at the present is basically why it's like a... It's like it, one... The Chinese Navy is very, very large, but it's not designed to fight all around the world. It can only fight in its own backyard because they can't supply it outside well, of it's Chinese only for now. They're, they're... It's made out of... Yeah, that, that will change. That will change. So, it's yeah. made out of something like two Cold War carriers and one native carrier built on those Cold War designs or something like which that. Are, which, which is going to end up being like five or six carriers in, in probably 10 years' time. Yeah, and... I mean, the U. I mean, for context, I think these things carry something like thirty or forty aircraft. And like the, uh, a bit more than that, but yeah, the new, the big new ones they're building themselves are more going to be more like fifty. But yeah, yeah. I mean, and a, a U.S. supercarrier carries just like ninety aircraft. Uh, so. Sometimes it's usually more like seventy these days. But yeah, but like, I mean, I'm not. I'm really not quaking in my boots over China. And, 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 and America, bear in mind, America only has um, something like nine active aircraft carriers. Um, it it's has, not as many as people think it is. It has, no, it has and they're not all active at once because as I keep trying to tell people, uh, a, one warship is useless. You need three to guarantee one all the time. So basically, America has three active carriers. And they can surge another two or three, depending on what's happening with them in terms of refits and all that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, so I believe that they have ten operational of the old like Nimitz class, and they also uh, have the Gerald Ford. Well, the Gerald Ford's not operational yet, and that's ridiculous because it's been like not operational for about eight years now. <laughs> There's something seriously wrong with the Gerald R. Ford, but there we go. Um, and um, it also has, I think it has like 10 or so also Marine Corps smaller carriers. So like it's a yeah, I, 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 It's actually, I think they're about, uh, the, those um, carriers that carry the um, F-35B that the Royal Navy also uses on its carriers, uh, I think they have about seven or maybe eight of those. Yeah, so... Um... No, no, no. So one of them is on active. So Gerald R. Ford is on active, active commission. No, it isn't. They're, they're yes, pretending. It they're, is. No, no, it's not. They're pretending it is. They're not. It's not. Trust me, mate. It's it's not doing anything anywhere near any possible enemy. All right. Um, but um... The, the, the American Navy has had a lot of disasters lately. Um, the the um, literal combat ships which the American Navy were calling privately little useless ships um, or something along those lines, um, are crap. And um, they're only now building one class of them instead of the two they started off with. And even the class they're building is crap. 
they're too small they can't do what they were supposed to do um they built the um zumwalt cast destroyers three of them and they have three of these ships they're enormously expensive and they have no main guns because the guns they designed for them did not work um uh, the american navy has real big problems at the moment and as steve says in the chat the lcs which is the uh literal combat ship which i think the americans called little crappy ships was what the royal navy used to call uh, sorry the the u.s navy used to call um they, they've been they've been a disaster the you, the american navy is in problems at the moment it really is and uh the gerald r ford whether or not the americans are claiming it is now in active service isn't it just isn't um the, the, it's had enormous problems with everything it's it's lifts it's ammunition hoist lifts um the electromagnetic catapults um it, it's just had a litany of problems and it's enormously expensive and people will have noticed the americans are not building another one of them at the moment they're trying to sort this one out first which is probably sensible but um yeah it, it, the, the american navy is not in a good position at the moment the, the one area in which uh, the Americans and the Western allies have a big advantage over the Chinese is in nuclear submarines. Our nuclear submarines, like the American and British ones, are vastly better than the um, Chinese ones. And I suspect if there is a war in the South China Sea, which is entirely possible, um, a lot of Chinese ships will suddenly go boom for no particular reason, which will be a nuclear hunter killer sub. Mm. Yeah, Go, going back to uh, perhaps our original um, uh, topic, <laughs> um, I, th I, I believe we were going to go into the consequences at some point. Yep. And um, one of the big consequences that I wanted to bring up that I think has been a genuine disaster is that in, in Britain during the interwar period, we, for the first time ever, um, willingly printed money um, in order to pay off government bills. Yeah. And um, this, of course, led to big problems in the 1920s. So you had the general strike and things like that. And it, and a lot of economists, even to this day, say the gold standard doesn't work because of things like that. But um, one of the things that's... And of course, like the gold standard it's probably just about the only modern way people say it's outdated it's not it's the only modern way of actually having a, a, an honest currency rather than and, a fiat currency yeah and um Churchill got rid of it and the thing is is that there was nothing wrong with the gold standard it was because we printed so much money and mm. we were still basically saying a hundred pounds is worth a hundred pounds of gold when in reality now it was hundred pounds is worth about 50 or so pounds of gold um but the government didn't want to acknowledge that um it, it was because of that fatal mistake that we now basically exist in a fiat currency paradigm um and that's true for most countries that went into the first world war that look, the gold standard base effectively died with the first world war and so now we are living in a world in which uh money can blip out of nowhere um your savings can disappear overnight um and so for me that's probably one of to my mind <coughs> the greatest the great consequences of the great war um well, that's kind of been the case since the 17th century i think because that's when you first started getting um the um that's <coughs> de facto fractional reserves of the um of the goldsmiths uh yes but the difference the difference is, is that um it's, it's just that the problem wasn't as bad the, the, well, you, the no, problem hang, wasn't as bad and also hang on, george can you tell me this because like i'm no financial expert at all I, the, yeah, sure. the, the dismal science is not something that i have ever totally understood but yeah. as i understand it that even in 1913 that promise on a british bank of england note that i promised to pay the bearer on demand this sum effectively in gold yeah. um was still true whereas oh, in, yeah it certainly wasn't in 1919. um no no in, yeah um the, b both of those things are true um so what rupert's brought up is that there is there's a single fractional reserve banking in which basically the bank 
I, I mean, fractional reserve banking is how banks make money. Mm. Um, and it's always going to happen no matter what. The difference is, is that the, with the gold standard, if the, if the bank cannot give you um, that gold when it happens, um, they could get into serious problems and you are still entitled to that gold. With the cessation of the gold standard, that's no longer the case. If the bank doesn't have any money, it's a tough shit for you too. Yeah. Um, and so, um, and that's where you can get a lot of big modern crises from. Um, and uh, and of course, you know, um, Rishi Sunak now wants to create our our very own cryptocurrency, which is literally that. I mean, that's literally not that, even uh, real that's byte that's byte code that's ones and yeah. zeros within your hard drive and is a move towards a, a, a cashless society in my opinion which everyone on the right should oppose everyone in general should be worried about because if the government you know if it, the, the government can then literally um I mean, I mean, suppose you keep your bank account to the totally to, can totally control your money yeah, <laughs> yeah. like yeah, it's, it's just take off a few zeros off the end because the government needs that money now. Um, and, and I mean, these days we're also talking about things like um, uh, I'm trying to remember what the term is now. Uh, interest rates were actually the, the, they're going to take money off you if you if you save it. Yeah. So so, so Robert Verlin, uh, Verlinden in the chat. Um, it's an interesting name. Uh, I, I like to know where it's from. Is it Dutch, maybe? Um, but um, he says um, currency is trust, fear to not. And that's technically true, but it's different orders of trust. Fiat currency is literally like ordered to trust. The government tells you it's worth that much. And so everyone, and so we will play pretend. Um, at least with the gold standard, you I'm have to. If you go back to the early 17th century goldsmith system, then it doesn't require trust because literally every certificate is it entitles you to an equal amount of gold that is in the vault. Yeah. Any yeah. time that, after that, that, that was what we were saying earlier. Uh, absolutely correct. Yeah, no, 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 no. But I mean, no, go because uh, you still get fractional reserve even in the the, uh, the gold standard system because if everybody tries to withdraw their gold at the same time, then that the system yeah. breaks down. Yeah, the, 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 the main difference is is the legal entitlement. Um, because under gold standard, you have that legal entitlement. Under fiat, you don't anymore. Because um, um, for those who, who want to know, um, what, uh, on your bank on your bank balance, when it says I declare that uh, the holder of this is owed um, five pounds, that actually originally meant pounds of gold. That's where the name comes from. So. This is this, uh, yeah. Uh, so John Hawkins says this is a slight digression. But what I was going to bring this back to was this. For me, looking back on the First World War, this is like the great travesty, and you get um, and from there, like you, we basically lost. Um, of course, the Federal Reserve starts becoming a dominant force in the United States, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And today, th this is like one of the big long shadows of the First World War is finance is now decided by government and is no longer um a trustworthy business and yeah I, I totally agree with that i mean look it, 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 to bring it back to the book uh, it comes back to my original point that like in 1913 britain was by a long way the richest nation in the world it certainly wasn't in 1919 to bring it right back to john Helm's book um, that's a fact. And that was the result of Britain joining the war in 1914. And then, even worse, against all British tradition, raising a mass land army. Something Britain had never, ever done before, ever. Mm. But Britain never had an army to compare with the big continental powers. We did not need one. We were a sea power. Um, I, I, I guess I guess that's my main bigger piece, though. From uh, what what you can, uh, I mean, I mean, of course, there's a whole bunch of other things you can say about the First World War in terms of consequences. Uh, the Second World War is a good one to go to. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, the people who said that the Second World War was a continuation of the first one, um, to a large degree, are not wrong. 
you know, you, yeah. you, you, could, you could really say that, that like 1913 to 1945 was one big complex that just had a bit of an interruption in the middle of it. Mm. And it was totally disastrous from Britain's point of view and from the point of view of the uh, white dominions and from the point of view of the British Empire. Totally disastrous. There was not one good thing about it. Nothing. It, it was entirely bad from our point of view. Like, uh, as I said earlier, and I'm going to stick to this, it would not have mattered to Britain if France had been heavily defeated in 1915. It would have made no possible difference to Britain. I mean, Rupert's made the point that it might have led to some sort of uh, recession. Well, big deal. That would have been a damn sight cheaper than World War I. Mm. But we can yeah. say that because we know that World War One happened how it did. Yeah, but I I'm, mean, I'm trying to keep know, one eye on what they actually knew at the time and what they thought was going to be the but, outcome. Yeah, but you have people like Gray, right? Who, as I said, I I think he was a bad guy in this, um, and I definitely think he was a bad guy from Britain's point of view. Um, Gray himself said, "We're in measurable distance of Armageddon." So he, it's not like he didn't know what was going to happen, because he did. I mean, all right, yeah, he might have said initially, oh, yeah, well, it's going to be a naval war and maybe there'll be a couple of British divisions. But it was under Gray's foreign secretaryship and the Liberal Party leadership that Britain organised the British Expeditionary Force, which um, was supposed to be six infantry divisions plus a very large cavalry division, although initially only four of the infantry divisions were sent to France. Um, so initially, even the British commitment was the largest Britain had ever done on the continent. I mean, there were more soldiers in that BEF that, than Wellington ever commanded, and that was before we brought in conscription. So I, I don't, I don't buy this. I know they didn't know what they were doing. Yes, they bloody well did. I mean, there, there is there's orders of magnitude of knowing what you're doing. Um, I mean, yeah, if, if they knew if they knew what the war was going to be and become, they they would have uh, instituted conscription on day one and start, started mobilizing a uh, continental style army, which they didn't to do. What, to what purpose? To what purpose? I, I mean, I, I would go one step further. Uh, I wager, if anyone knew what was going to happen in the First World War, it wouldn't have happened. <laughs> But, well, they tried to they tried to make it not happen. It's just there was a, a, a number I, of. Uh... I, I think everyone really knew what was going to happen, and 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 to some degree, you're right, Rupert. Yeah, it, like even at the last minute, the Kaiser etc. didn't really want to do it. But the alliance, well, yeah, so, the so alliance and mobilization systems and all this kind of shit made it inevitable. Well, yes and no, because they both like both sides agreed on what the terms of. Um not turning it into a into a continent-wide war would be it's just the right people didn't know the right pieces of information to convey that fact so russia agreed with uh, well russia agreed to stop mobilizing if uh, austria would agree to a uh, war without annexations and that's mm -hmm. the only condition on which the hungarian diet would accept the war so the, the hungarian parliament would only accept the war um, be declared on the basis of no annexations, mm -hmm. th thus meaning that that was the terms on which the Austrians were planning to go into Serbia. Um, but Russia wasn't talking directly to Austria, they were talking to Germany, and, Ge and Austria hadn't let Germany know that that was the terms of the war. So for all Germ Germany knew, they couldn't give that assurance to Russia that there would be no annexations. Yeah, and but if they also, had known that, I mean, no but 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 Conrad in in Austria Hungary, the the the, um, the military guy, um, he he was absolutely determined to fight Serbia. Yes, but he didn't have unilateral diplomatic authority. No, he People didn't. Did he... were trying to stop the war from happening on the whole. Yeah, but but because you had this system where everyone needed to mobilize and have railway timetables and all this kind of crap. Um, you know, if, if, if Austria goes to war with Serbia, Russia's going to back Serbia because basically Serbia was a Russian client. Um, and if Russia goes to war with Austro-Hungary, then Germany's going to go to war with Russia. And if Germany goes to war with Russia, France is going to go to war with Russia. 
and because Britain had these ridiculous entente with um, France and Russia, Britain was going to go to war because of that, although we pretended it was over Germany going into Belgium, which was a bullshit excuse, to be honest. Uh, yes, it did start to gain a, a certain amount of momentum, but at every step of this process, previous crises had been uh, de-escalated. Mm, narrowly, and, and no previous... Look, I, I think Conrad is a bad guy in, in, in Austro-Hungary. I'd be interested to see what Apostolic Majesty says about Conrad, because I know he's a, a big fan of Austria-Hungary and, and knows a lot about their history. But um, I don't think he was a particularly good guy or very useful. Um, I, I don't see why Austria and Serbia couldn't have had their war and presumably Austria would have eventually won and good luck. I mean, I, I, who cares, basically? You know, it's a shit hole in the Balkans. Well, because the, the Russian fear was that, uh, that uh, Serbia would be, well, one of two things would happen. Either they would be uh, turned into a client state of Austria, and thus, you know, it's, it's de facto territorial acquisition, or it is outright annexed by Austria as a means of uh, stopping them causing future trouble which they also couldn't... Uh, which couldn't the Russians wouldn't have liked, but, like, I, again, like, speaking as an Englishman, I don't care what happens to Russia. This is why I wouldn't have had an alliance with Russia or France. This is really my whole point. Britain did not need to become involved in this. And under Salisbury, if Salisbury had been the Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary in 1913, Britain would not have become involved in this. We would have just said, well, I, we, we don't care what happens to Serbia. And if that pisses off Russia, well, OK, well, that's Russia's beef with Austro-Hungary, not our problem. Do, do, you, do you see what I'm saying? That, that would have absolutely been Salisbury's view. Salisbury would have like done what he could to have, uh, have handed this off from getting Britain involved in it. Not our problem. And Britain could have, meanwhile, made the Royal Navy stronger, and just stood there making money off of all these people by selling them arms and all the rest of it, just like America did for three years of the First World War. And, and we wouldn't have got involved in any of this crap. This is my major point and why I like this book, because it's basically what it argues, is that Salisbury had the right idea. I, I, I don't know what, uh, what you think, Rupert and George, but that's my whole take from this thing. And one mm. reason I thought it was worth discussing. Yes, I basically do agree with that assessment in retrospect, but I also understand why some of the decisions were taken that sort of got them to that point. Except for Gray, Gray seems to have been mostly just a moron. Um, yeah, yeah, he d he didn't see that. Like you know, if you're gonna, I, as I said, Winston Churchill, who I'm not a big fan of, said that the Entente's gave Britain all the responsibilities with none of the advantages of of alliances. Which is exactly what they did. And how Gray couldn't see that, I don't understand. Because, like, Gray agreed with the French. First of all, he did these uh, military conversations between the um, generals of the British and French army, which in itself is enough to scream at anyone who sees traditional British policy that this is crap. Because the British army was, like, the, by far the secondary British armed force compared to the Royal Navy. And, and then. Uh, you have the French removing most of their ships from um, the channel ports and sending them to the Mediterranean because the Royal Navy, apparently, although I don't think the Fisher totally agreed with this at the time, will protect France in, on the Atlantic side, which was nonsense, again, if, if Britain's not in an alliance. I mean, I, I generally agree with the thesis of the book. Um... Uh, my, my general take on just about everything is <laughs> if you can avoid a war, uh, do so. If you can avoid a war with people who aren't your enemies, definitely do so. <laughs> um, yep. Which is my take on the First World War. Um, yep. Britain had no... Um, Britain had no... And I believe even to this day, it doesn't really have any actual enemies apart from maybe Argentina. Um, and so... 
there was just no need for that. There, there was definitely no need for this war. And um, to that extent, I definitely agree with the thesis of the book. Um, I also very much agree that um, it seems that statesmanship in general um, declined <laughs> um, from the period of 18, 1870 towards 1914. Um, uh, I mean, I'm, a, I'm a personally a big Israeli fan, but I accept that Charmley doesn't take as positive a view of him. Uh, he's more of a Salisbury fellow himself. Um, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm more of a Salisbury fellow, but I mean, both I and Charmley, I think, prefer um, the Israeli to uh, Gray and Asquith. <laughs> so, you know. Um, yeah. uh, and uh, I, I definitely take uh, my my thesis when it regards foreign policy. Um, I mean, perhaps it, I, I take it even further than many of these people is that if it doesn't concern the British people, then don't don't get involved. I mean, of course, these uh, most of these men were still um, imperialists of one fashion or another. I am, of course, the exception to that. I think it was a waste of time. But yeah, that being... you, I won't call you a little Englander as you are a Scot. You're a little <laughs> Britoner. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, but um, even all that aside, and I mean, that's a topic for another another stream or another day or another conversation. Um, uh, the First World War was undoubtedly not only one of Britain's great mistakes, but one of history's great travesties i think it was the um, original sin of britain and the empire to be honest with you, you. Well, well, yeah but um i mean i was gonna go and say it's possibly one of the great greatest historical travesties of all time because it moved power away from europe towards north america it made um it um, it eradicated um the old aristocratic um houses of europe um, Look at and, the death duties they had to bring in after World War I. Um, and has given us the, as um, academic agent will give you no end of essaying about um, the merchant class elites and things like that. Um, mm, which ac I've, academic agent's knowledge of history is um, limited, shall we say? Well, well sure, but the, the the thesis is still relatively cogent um, regarding Britain because. Um, uh, we are t th today um, ruled over by um, what would have been in the Victorian era the um, <coughs> reach, and yeah. I yeah. mean I'm not, you know, um, uh, you know, um, there, there, <laughs> we were a, seeing what there, kind there, of there, 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 there is a great line in the book, George, um, where um, he's talking about some German, sorry, some English woman who was sorry, some German woman who was married to um, Sir something Maple, the furniture tycoon. You know, uh, yeah. uh, the, the older people will remember their stores. Um, uh, and uh, uh, he makes the point that people like um, Salisbury did not, dis did not regard people like maple as their social equals <laughs> you know <it's> like, <laughs> they were not you know um, i mean like salisbury salisbury's family had been running british and english politics going back to like queen elizabeth the first time you know and um i mean maybe i'm a tiny bit biased because i come from a posh background and all that and blah 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 um but um i would wager that the old landed classes did a better job at managing keeping the British people's interests as a whole yes. uh, together totally than the post, um, than the sort of the rise of the sort of the middle classes and um, the likes that we have today. Yeah, and totally um, totally and uh, that's totally yeah. You probably want to go a little bit further back, though, for when uh, when their teeth were being ripped out of uh, you know, their ability to continue governing. Sure, well, so, Salis Salisbury, I think, was was the last one of these people. I mean, yeah. I've, I've I've long said I think he was the last really conservative British prime minister. 
And one of the things the book makes the precise point about is that when Salisbury looked at anything in terms of um, foreign relations in Britain, his first, second, third, and last point of view is what's to Britain's advantage? Always. That, that's what he always looked at. That's all he cared about. And, and sometimes he would do stuff that some of the jingos wouldn't like. Um, sometimes he would do stuff that seemed relatively weak, but it always to Britain's advantage. Yeah. Everything he did. Um, so, yeah, so that's that would be another general thesis of mine. Um, because uh, at the end of the day, um, I mean, the, the, the thing that arose after the First World War was, of course, universal suffrage. I mean, I mean, I know a lot of people here think that women's suffrage was like a disaster. I Absolute dis disaster, yes. I disagree. I think, I think you have to go a tiny bit further than that if you're going to bother with it at all and say that universal suffrage is a problem. Um, but you, um, mean, you mean male universal? Suffrage. Yeah, yeah. You, you, I, I would say that even male universal suffrage would be a problem. No, I, I, mean, I, I don't even support that. I would support household suffrage. Yeah, even, um, even today, I'd support that, and but, probably but, only for twenty-five-year-olds upwards. Um, I um, but like all that aside, I, um, like the 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 main thing that changed in the First World War, and of course, um. I mean, the big Marxists of the time were thinking, oh, this is the war. This is the war that will bring on the revolution. And they were right. They were just right, weren't right in the way they thought it would be. No. It turned Europe and um, it turned Europe and the Western di uh, diaspora um, towards democratic politics and democratic. So, I mean, the, the, is... the, the, the only Marxian re revolution was basically started, funded, and supported by the German general staff in Russia. Yeah. So, you know. I, I, well, I mean, the, the, um, the German revolution was Marxist as well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, Rosa Luxemburg and all those, Rosa Luxemburg and all those people afterwards, yeah, sure. Oh, well, I mean, and the, and the Social Democrats, it's just that they had a, uh, a disagreement on methods. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely true. And they thought that people like Rosa Luxemburg were incompetent because they were uh, dogmatically opposed to planning. I, I, don't, I don't disagree with you at all, Ruth, but I mean, even when it comes to the Austrian painter, he was a lefty, he wasn't a righty, really, in yeah. most respects. Um, but, um, yeah, so the First World War in many ways represents the dying of old and st stable politics and the, uh, the start of chaotic, um, nepotistic... Well, I suppose previous politics were nepotistic, but not in this, not in the manner I mean, and uh, progr progressive, um, the progressive infestations we might call them. So there you go. Um, ben Gale in the chat: Women's suffrage was basically going to happen pre-war. No, I don't think it was. Um, first of all, the suffragettes were terrorists. They planted bombs. They literally planted bombs and did all sorts of shit like that. Um, and I'll tell you a story, uh, Ben Gale. When, like, I'm an old bastard, right? I'm 57 in a month or so. And um, when I was a young man, I knew quite a lot of World War I veterans. And I'm, I'm very happy to say that I spoke to guys who went over the top on the song and stuff like that, did the incredible things that I can't even imagine, even though I was a soldier myself. Um, and I knew this one. I, I used to work for this preservation society in London that was like um, looking after the abandoned Surrey docks where there were loads of different birds and fish and even things like foxes and all sorts of stuff you wouldn't expect in the middle of London. And uh, we used to sell day tickets for people to go fishing to fund ourselves. And for the, for the old boys, it was like 25 pence or something, but I usually didn't even charge them that. I used to give them a ticket. And so I'd sit there for hours because I was always army and barney. Like, what well, this is when I was like maybe, I don't know, 15, 14. Uh, and I'd sit there and listen to these old chaps telling me these stories about the First World War. And this one dude, 
was wounded quite badly on the Somme and he lifted up his shirt and showed me this enormous fucking scar that he still had like 55, 60 years later from, from being wounded. Uh, but they fixed him up in hospital in England and uh, he was, his wife was absolutely terrified he was going to die and she hated to see him in British Army uniform. So when he went home on embarkation leave before he went back to France to join, rejoin his battalion, he put on civilian dress and he got off a tram in London and this very posh middle-class young girl gave him a white feather because he wasn't in uniform. And this is a bloke like he'd been almost killed on the song. And this was in, in uh, middle of 1917 before the battle of um, what, the, what they call um, uh, Passchendaele these days, which was third Ypres. Uh, and, and like th this bloke told me he spat in this woman's face. And I did not blame him at all. And she was a suffragette. And the suffragettes during World War One, that's what they did. They went round giving anyone not in, in, in British, uni, British forces uniform white feathers, including little boys at 14 and loads of blokes who were on wound leave and stuff like this. They were pathetic. And I'm sorry, I have no room for them whatsoever. Fuck the suffragettes. They were wanks. Excuse my language. I mean, going to the original point of women's suffrage being inevitable, I mean, I would argue that um, suffrage was always inevitable. Why? Um, uh, suffrage of any kind was inevitable. Why? Um, simply because of um, simply because of the way demographics work. Um, do, do, you, do you know why Trudeau wins in Canada? Because a, a lot of idiot lefty women think he's cute. Um. Sure. I mean, I mean, I I don't know anything about Canada's voting data. I, what I do know about is UK voting data for a start, and um, the balance of the way men versus women vote, as I have discussed ad nauseum, and I have brought empirical evidence for multiple times, is they are very much balanced. Um, if they're the, married, if they're married. No, 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 no. It's unconditional. Uh, the only, yeah, the only. I the don't. Only, I don't think you're right, mate. I think married women tend to follow their husbands. Um, single women, they, they vote off all sorts of nonsense that has nothing to do with anything because women are driven by emotion, not, not facts. But either way, um, the, the point originally was, um, was um, what is suffrage inevitable? And I would argue that it probably was, and that's just a simple reality of post-industrial human beings have a lot, in, a lot of time on their hands and um not having to worry about dying at any um any given winter because they didn't have enough grain and that leaves allows people to think about things like politics and should this person and, 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 and jobs where they could sit on comfortable office chairs but yeah yeah exa exactly yeah. and that uh, and to that end i would argue that like while the first world war of course sped up the universal suffrage path um uh, it, um, I think that was probably going to happen anyway. But what I would say and what I would qualify is that the First World War um, eradicated the... I, I mean, universal suffrage was already happening. Britain had already given multiple bills which had increased the amount of people who could vote. But there was still um, a, a large and strong avenue um, for... George, the, there was a better movement than the suffragettes, though, wasn't there? There, there was a movement... That were supported by some men and women the suffragists uh, yeah, yeah. They, they were a much more realistic movement than the vile terrorists yeah, and yeah. givers out of wild white feathers that were the suffragettes but who were scum theme. who are the people today we we somehow or another i say we using the the, the turd in my pocket we because it ain't me who, who who somehow celebrate these suffragettes with a vile statue in london for example I, I, I mean, yeah, but I mean, getting back to the original point I was trying to convey is that I don't think with the, like if the First World War hadn't happened, I don't think we would have seen um, the stripping away of aristocratic revenue and prestige. No. And to that end, um, uh, I think that I, I think that universal suffrage would have probably happened anyway, but it probably wouldn't have been as bad in this alternative type timeline. Yeah. 
Most yeah, of the no, stuff is top down anyway. Like the, I mean, I, I would I would say that maybe it happens regardless, but not due to any kind of inevitability. Uh, more due to the uh, trajectory of political constitutional change pushed by um, the you know the radicals and the liberals. Yeah, because this stuff has always been pushed pushed by them rather than yeah. demanded from below yeah. in any. And and, and like um, uh, let's remember, Rupert, that like you know what we're talking about here is is the villain of John Chalmers' book is Gray, the Liberal Foreign Secretary and the Liberal Government from 1905. That they, they're the bad guys in the, in this book, and I think correctly so. Well, yeah, but when we're talking about domestic politics, I mean, none of the uh, none of the good guys are really doing that much to help either. They're just either good at playing the game of of media and and thus manage to keep things broadly as they are, or uh, actively encourage the process so that they can get more more rabble to rabble rouse. All right. Um, oh well, I don't think that's at all true of Salisbury, for a start. Um, I'm not aware Sal of anything that he did domestically to. Uh, Sort of try and turn back, turn back the clock uh, in any meaningful way. Uh, so, uh, Salisbury was extremely anti and suspicious of uh, press-driven public opinion. Very much so, and, and the book repeatedly makes that point. Oh, so like, Trump, he, but that doesn't really. No, hang on. Like, Trump's Trump's got nothing to do with this. Let's let's stick on our subject here and not even go across the line. But. Um, I, I just think that if you looked at a Britain that didn't join World War, didn't have Grey, didn't have the Liberal Party, didn't have Entente's with France and Russia, but had a government run by Salisbury or somebody like Salisbury, um, and had done imperial tariff preference uh, in 1908, um, and doesn't join World War One in 1914, and instead has an armed neutrality in the North Sea and the Channel, and just says to the German Navy, look, if you don't interfere with us, we won't interfere with you. But if you do, we'll sink you. Um, I, 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 it's, and France loses in 1915 at latest. And Germany takes a load of money off the French and probably a couple of colonies. None of that affects Britain badly. Uh, and in 1916, Britain is still much the richest nation in the world, has much the most efficient shipyards in the world has much the biggest navy in the world the americans haven't made a huge amount of money from um, selling stuff to uh, people in only a year and a half of war um, and um, the whole world is extremely different in that situation than it w was in 1919 i mean all right there's all sorts of butterflies going on here and like you know alternative history is a dubious science but in that situation the whole world is vastly different in a peaceful Europe in 1916, where Britain <coughs> not only didn't get involved in World War One, but also continued expanding the Royal Navy. Um, and um, Britain still remains the richest and in many respects, most powerful nation in the world. And I don't know, I, I don't see any bad aspect of that from the British point of view. None of it. I don't know if either of you chaps do, but I, I certainly don't. Well, I'm always going to be, <laughs> I'm always going to be the imperial naysayer. Um, yeah, yeah, I know, I know you're not, but even so, Britain in 1916, say, after Germany has beaten France, um, Britain is not a dare. They're still the richest nation in the world. The Royal Navy is even bigger than it actually was because we would have continued building new battleships in 14 and 15, which we stopped at the time. Um, and um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I just don't see in what way, shape or form Britain is in any way worse off rather than hugely better off. Also, I mean, you, you, you can even go to like social stuff, like the beginning of the end of the Church of England was its fanatic support for World War One? Yeah, like no. many, many people who lost um, uh, sons and fathers and brothers, uh, men and women, were turned off to the Church of England by that shit in World War One. It was the beginning of the end of it in many respects. Yeah, it, that was definitely a misguided move. 
Um, yeah, just a sec. Uh, something's going outside my room. All right, you've got people singing, mate. That's no problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. It's just, uh, yeah. Um, I, I didn't want it to interfere with the chat. Uh, it's not. It's not a problem at all. But um, I think. I think they're going to. I think they're going to die down anyway. Um, I mean, what? All, all, all I would say is that um, my personal take on it is that like military power is not the be all and end all. I mean, I, I mean, no, of it's not. Diet, no, it has it, to be backed up by industrial and financial power. Absolutely, it does. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the, the main the main travesty for me will not be um, a an army that isn't as big or whatever. The main the main travesty for me will always be um, the unnecessary death and basically the death of Europe. Um, because yeah, for I mean me, that, that that goes without saying too. I mean, yeah. without Britain, World War One doesn't go four years; it goes two. Or no, it, it it goes two, and more importantly. Um, like France would have probably had another revolution or whatever. Who cares? Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, <laughs> that thing. Yeah. Um, but like I, a French revolution is not as bad as a German revolution nope. or a Russian revolution. I might totally have. agree. Well, well I, mean, I don't. I don't know how long the. I, I don't know what happens to Russia. Russia's a black box in that scenario because. Uh, Russia had already yeah. been kicked around so much that it they kind of needed five. a yeah yeah they needed, well, they needed Russia a almost too. had a revolution after the Russia Japanese war. No, they did. They did have. Well, a revolution. they did, but it, I mean, they almost had a success. Yeah. You, you, you normally call it's it's funny bit of uh, lexicon, isn't it? Because normally uh, a failed revolution isn't called a revolution. <laughs> so it's, it's, um, it's an uprising. Well, it, yeah. yeah. No, I mean it, it succeeded in its aims. It's just that the political environment that was created was successfully navigated by the uh, the government hence well you know afterwards so well they weren't back with the german general staff like um uh, lenin was so you yeah. <laughs> know so, yeah um i always think there's a supreme irony in, in germany in 1945 and the german general staff in 1917 but you know just me <laughs> but um, um yeah i, I look i, I just don't see the world being worse for Britain not joining and the war finishing in 1916 and France getting beat because, like, I don't care about France. I don't care about France now. Like, I, I think if you did a if you did a poll of most British people, off is France Britain's friend? Most British people would say no, even today. Like, how many hundreds and hundreds of years have we fought each other? You know. It's, it's, I, I, I honestly, I, I think it was a false policy. It was a stupid policy supporting France and then Russia. Yeah. I guess the risk is that they have some kind of uh, communist thing. Well, in because, France. Yeah. Because they were the other, the other major hotbed of, uh, of communist thought. Yeah, they, they, they might have done it. I don't think that would have mattered to Britain anyway. That would have just made France even less efficient. Well, yeah, but it becomes an, uh, an ideological contagion as it did when um, Russia. Uh, let's, let's go back to one thing which I think a lot of people also forget is that in 1913-14 the major worry for most British politicians was not a war in Europe. It was a war in Britain over the the nonsense of Irish home rule. Yeah, I, I was I was literally just about to bring up John Best's comment. What what about the future? Um, yeah. um, uh, hot take: uh, Irish independence was basically a certainty since the the what they call the Great Famine. Um, Don't agree with that, but okay. Um, I mean, the, the thing is, is that the Irish parliaments since then have represented that um you get a whole bunch of uh you, you i mean the irish nationalist vote was just very strong um particularly going going towards the 1900s and all most so, of the elites though were were loyalists and they true almost true. lost the war of independence and if they lose that then there's really not all that much left true yeah 
And, and I mean, uh, it's not fair to say that even the, the, the ordinary people of Wyoming in, in 1913, uh, sorry, 1914, were, were nationalists. They weren't particularly. Like there was no, there was no problem with Irish recruitment for the British Army in 1940. No, 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 that that much is true. Um, it's, um, I, I would say that that why there was very Irish loyalism was much stronger in 1914 than it was in say 1918. Um, uh, I can't help but feel that given time, Irish separatism would have still happened. It probably wouldn't have happened the same way and with the same parents, but I could see it happening. I, I think the problem in Ireland was if you were going to have, and this is something Gladstone never realized, and I detest Gladstone, right? Okay? Um, look, I have my problems with Disraeli, but give me Disraeli rather than Gladstone any day of the week. But um, uh, what Gladstone never realizes, if you are going to have an, an Irish parliament, and this comes back very much to modern stuff with like the, the, the Scottish Assembly and the Welsh Assembly. As soon as you do that, you are creating something that is trying to tear you apart. Just necessarily, that's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, the better alternative would be to probably, if, if you have to do something like that, then create regional parliaments instead and have them work. Um, piecemeal and then try to get try to get them to work. Again. No, <laughs> don't do it. It doesn't work. Yeah, I, I, I don't agree with any of it. To be honest with you, I really don't. I think I think you have a parliament in Westminster and you send MPs there, and you broadly send MPs there um, in proportion to the population. And of course, Scotland has far more MPs than the population should really have, even today. When yeah, it's because, it is because a two, two Scotsman is one Englishman. <laughs> Sorry, I can resist. <laughs> yeah, of course you couldn't. Yeah. Sorry, sweaty sock. Honestly. <laughs> but yeah. Um, well, yeah. I mean, you still, so even if you do everything from Westminster, you're still creating the problem of assembling a bunch of people who ostensibly re represent all of Ireland. It creates the same problem as a. Uh, as yeah, a, yeah, but, but, but bear, 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 bear in mind, um, Rupert. In 1914, there was going to be a civil war in Ireland. The only thing that stopped it was World War One. Really, sure. fine. The, the, like you know, Ulster was not going to take that shit then. They wouldn't take it now, let alone then. You know, and then the Ulster guys were vastly more strong than they are now. And, and like you know, one of Blair's many, many traitorous moves was the Good Friday Agreement, which while it let out all of the provisional IRA scumbag terrorists, um, we were still prosecuting British soldiers for stuff in Northern Ireland until very recently, like two or three years ago. You know, if you want to know what a scumbag Blair was, that's what his, um, his Good Friday Agreement did, which was brokered by that scum Clement who used to go to Epstein Island all the time. So, I mean, to tell you all you need to know about that, you wink. But anyway, um, yeah, I, I, in 1948, that was the major thing that was exercising everyone and all of the British Army, for example, because a large, a very large number of British Army officers were Ulsterman. A very large, like the, the Ulster guys were the nearest the Brit, British equivalent to the... Um, Prussian Junker class. They were the nearest we came to that. If, if you look at a lot of the British generals in World War II, for example, they're Ulsterman. Yes. Yeah, I'm aware of this. Uh, same mine were. Same, same mine, basic phenomenon as well. And uh, I mean, that's why I'm not necessarily inclined to see um, this uh, civil war as, as inevitable because. Or, you know, the, this um, uprising is inevitable because it's something that um, Prussia was able to manage quite well for most of its history because they they obviously had a... And, 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 and most of the ordinary people of Dublin, for example, which was a fairly loyalist city back then, um, were scandalized by the 1916 <laughs> uprising. They didn't support it at all. Yeah. The vast majority of Dubliners didn't support it at all. That's not where the IRA support was. 
Uh, MindWeb in the chat says the IRA was one run by MI6. Now, MindWeb comes out with loads of stuff, which is like absolute nonsense. Like, for example, um, there's no such thing as nuclear weapons and the Earth is flat. But in this particular instance, he's not totally wrong because like the, the, the provisional IRA, which was a Marxist organization and still is, and that's why Sinn Féin today supports um, Brits out and Africans in, in Ireland, um uh, uh the, the the provisional RRA was absolutely totally penetrated by my success as well so don't dispute that it doesn't necessarily mean much though because uh some of the bolsheviks by the uh okrana yeah a bit, a bit different provisional RRA were running a cell system where you had like somewhere between four and six to eight people only supposedly only knowing about stuff although you you had the ever president ever present paddy factor of them blowing themselves up which i used to find amusing but then i did two tours in northern ireland with the show, um, back in the 80s and um yeah um they they were pretty pretty well penetrated by british intelligence but then of course tony blair came in and like basically surrendered with the Good Friday Agreement. And it was, it was a surrender. Um, all of the provisional IRA guys, or virtually all of them, were let out of jail, even if they killed loads of them and children with their fucking bombs. Um, and like I said, they were still prosecuting or trying to prosecute British soldiers up until about three years ago. It, it was pathetic. And one of Blair's many, many traitorous moves but again, I'm going to bring it back to what we were talking about. Um, Britain in 1916, with France having been beaten, Britain never getting involved in the war, Royal Navy being stronger than it was, uh, British Army probably being a bit stronger than it was too, um, not spent any money, probably made a lot of money by selling weapons to both sides if we could. Um, how does that, is that not a better position for Britain? Is it possible it's not? Because I don't see any way it is. Well, the main thing that comes to mind is the um, the fact that all of the agreements would be reneged on, so Britain's Britain's word would be mud again on the international. No, no, um, hang on. What, what what agreements are we talking about? I'm saying we don't have grey and we don't have it in Tartes. Okay. I'm I'm saying we keep Salisbury's position of keeping the Europeans at arm's length. Well, again, I I, uh, I know this isn't a perspective that you agree or not not a, a reading of the book that you agree with but i do very much see that as a transitionary period between um between two states not necessarily as a deliberate policy so i don't but necessarily he, know that it's a sta stable equilibrium uh, d d d doesn't um Chalmney make it clear that the the british foreign secretary who replaced um salisbury when salisbury was just prime minister i can't remember his name at the top of my head. Um, he didn't do what Gray did. I mean, yes, over the Agadir crisis, he said, look, we won a conference and we're not necessarily going to be on German side. But he certainly didn't promise the French British military support. And um, Charmley makes that very clear. Uh, wasn't it towards the tail end of Salisbury that uh, they'd been trying to ingratiate themselves to Russia without... Um... No, without success. No, talking about um, no, Britain being wouldn't... wrong on Crimea and uh... Uh, no, they never said that. Yeah, um, no, no, that's in there. That's in there. I no, but the, no, I I know what you're talking about, but the, the the British politicians never said they were wrong on Crimea. They thought that amongst themselves. In fact, I think Salisbury did that as a thought experiment, like he sometimes did. Um, like I I I even mentioned earlier that Salisbury talked about abandoning the British policy on Turkey. But he, he that was a thought experiment. It wasn't something he actually did practically in terms of diplomacy. I don't know that I'll be able to find the, the excerpt, but it was definitely in there because they... Uh, yeah, I, then... I, read, I, I read this like four hours ago. Mate. So, I'm so did I. <laughs> yeah. So, it, no, it, this was a thought experiment that Salisbury... Uh, Charlie makes the point that Salisbury sometimes... When he was talking to friends 
like not foreign diplomats, other people in the British government would would do thought experiments, he would say out loud. But they weren't something that he would then go and put to a German or a French or a, or a Russian diplomat. They were well, specifically talked about being disappointed that uh, Russia gave nothing back. If it was concrete. Yeah. He, he says all the way through that Salisbury could never trust Russia because they never gave anything back. He makes that point repeatedly, which is true. They didn't. But then the Germans were also on the same level because the Germans only wanted a British alliance if the British were scared enough to go into a German alliance. And, and you know, and then the, the Germans would demand their pound of flesh, which Salisbury, for example, was never willing to give them. Like, because if, if, if you had a Anglo-German alliance, um, Anglo policy would then have to take into account what the Germans wanted. And Salisbury was never willing to do that, rightly, in my opinion. Although, of course, when Gray did his French and uh, Russian alliances, exactly the same thing applied. But in this case, it was Britain had to do what France and Germany, uh, France and Russia wanted, which is also nonsense. Th this is why, like, Splendid Isolation is, is the name of the book. It's why it's the name of our weekly streams, because it was when Britain was actually um, uh, performing a pro-British foreign policy. You know, keep the Royal Navy strong and don't worry about anything else is, is really the basis of it. Um, my neighbors are less noisy now. Um, <laughs> no worries. Um, well, I hope you gave, what gave them a good talking to them. Oh, goodness, no. Uh, <laughs> um, I, let people have their fun. That's absolutely fine by my book. Um, is there anything else really to be said? Um, I, for, for my part, I don't, I don't really think there's much else that can really be brought up. I mean, I think Charmy's book is pretty, is very good. I really enjoy his prose. Um, so yeah, he, those, he writes well. Yeah, he does. So I propose that given, those... given he's writing about diplomatic history, which is not the easiest thing to write interestingly yeah. about. Um, so if you're in the chat, I, I'd recommend you read it. Oh, patriotic archives just joining. Uh, hi, dear boy. Um, cool. Going to play um, one of his tunes in a minute, so that's one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sterling work as ever, dear boy. Um, and. Um, Really much out. Yeah, I, I think that's probably about it for me. Uh, as I said, the, my, my final point is that, like, had Britain not joined World War One in 1914, and had we at most said we're going to have an armed neutrality in the North Sea in the Channel, so you know, German Navy comes out, don't come near our warships, or we'll sink you, um, and we don't care who wins out of France and Russia, or or France and Germany, or Austro-Hungary and Russia, no interest to us. We're just going to stay out of it. It is inconceivable to me that Britain in 1916, because by 1916 Germany would certainly have won against France, um, Britain's not in an immeasurably stronger position than she really was when, in fact, on 1916, she was launching attacks on the Somme that saw the largest single casualties in the British Army in a single day ever. And they were some of the best Brits there were. They were all volunteers. And um, 20,000 of them were killed and 50 odd thousand of them were wounded in one day for absolutely no purpose, whatever. Some of the best men Britain would ever produce. Mm. Um, yeah. Uh, could you imagine how many more Tolkien's we've lost yeah. uh, that we just don't know about? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely correct. I mean, just look at the number of friends he lost in World War One. Yeah. Um, Ge geniuses. I mean, scientific geniuses, literary geniuses. Um, look, just uh, hang, uh, absolute good blokes, people who were leaders, um, people who were hard workers, because the best, best guys joined up in 1948. The best of the best all joined up, whether it was intellectually or whatever. They all fucking more joined up 
and they were all wasted for no good purpose whatsoever. Not because the British Army was particularly bad, just because that's what happened in World War One in that era in land warfare. Mm. We we lost so many good men who 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 would have done great things in the nineteen twenties and nineteen thirties, and we also lost our financial position. As the richest nation in the world, we lost our naval position as easily the greatest naval power in the world. Um, we lost a good deal of trust from many of the dominions because um, Canada, Australia, New Zealand all had very high casualties in World War One for no bloody good reason. Um, as I said earlier, the Church of England, its descent started in World War One because it supported the bloody war. Um, every single bad thing that has happened to Britain since 1918 um, can be put down to the First World War. Uh, and like I said, that's why I regard it as the original sin of Great Britain and the Empire. Joining it in 1914 and especially raising a mass land army against all British tradition. Something we've never ever done before. Mm. Yeah, I'm Pat gonna... Pat Patriotic Archives says the death of Edwardian England. Um, it, it was the death of Victorian England, really. You know, uh, historians talk about the long 19th century, and the long 19th century actually goes to 1948. Yeah. Um, Duke, it's almost 12 o'clock here. Yeah, <laughs> no still, worries, man. I'm I know gonna... we've been going on for ages. Yeah. I, I said I might do three hours, and we've almost, almost done that, so yeah. yeah. So, um, no night, worries. Night many, lights. many thanks for coming on, mate. Go on. No, no problem. All the best. All right. Um, bye. R Rupert, did you have something um, you 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 wanted to bring up? Uh, there's one more point for my sanity because I found the quote. Go on, then. Maybe you read this differently, but I'll just I'll just read out the quote verbatim. Yeah. Sure. Over the next few years, Salisbury uh, not only lost no opportunity to cooperate with Russia, he actively sought them out. He followed up his conversation with Nicholas II about the future of Turkey in September 1896 with a calculated bid for détente. Speaking at the Guildhall on the 9th of November, Salisbury declared that it was a, quote, superstition of antiquated diplomacy that there is any necessary antagonism between Russia and Great Britain, unquote. He went further still on January uh, 1897 when he blamed Britain for rejecting Nicholas I's overtures in 1853 and stated that he and Disraeli had, quote, put all our money on the wrong horse, unquote. Yeah, I read that and I do read it differently. Okay. I, 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 if the I Russians had responded to these initiatives positively with more than words, Salisbury would have had something to, uh, with which to ward off those critics who thought that he was simply appeasing the unappeasable and they did yeah, not. Yeah, I, 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 I agree, but um, there's two things. Salisbury recognized that Russia wasn't going to reply to that. Um, after he made the speech, obviously, the speech is, I should say, um, and comments, uh, and, and the Russians didn't reply to that. Um, and Salisbury was always up for settling individual in disputes in individual parts of the world with individual countries. He was always for that. Like he would have done that with France, he would have done that with Germany. In fact, he did do it with France and Germany on different occasions. Um, but it, it, this wasn't anything like a general alliance that he was looking for. Do, 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 do you get what I'm talking about there? Uh, he, that he seems wasn't, completely he, in contradiction to the text. No, he wasn't looking for a general alliance with Russia. The key to the key to diplomatic flexibility was Russia. It might not be possible for Britain to return to the relationship she had uh, she had had with Russia before the Crimean War. Uh, mm -hmm. Quote, but it is an object to be wished for and approached as opportunity offers. Unquote. Yeah, that's talking was, about an alliance. No, absolutely not. It's not. If, if uh, you, you, I, 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 Rupert, it is an I object to be wished for. I don't know how you read that any other way. Well, no, uh, no, uh, a settlement on certain issues in certain places. That was all Salisbury ever was interested in doing with any nation. He was never interested in a general alliance. I mean, the whole book makes that clear. Because, like, Salisbury's the hero of the book, just as grey as the villain. 
And, and Salisbury was always too pragmatic to want a general alliance with anyone. But he didn't want a Russian alliance. He was happy to sort out certain items with Russia in certain parts of the world, but he didn't want a general alliance. And the, uh, I don't understand exactly how, that, though. No, I don't think it is, man. I really disagree with you on that. I mean, you know, you and I will have to agree to disagree on it, but I, 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 so. I if, if you read the whole book, Salisbury's the hero and Gray's the villain. That's the whole point of the book. The book is a supporter of Salisbury's um, traditional country, conservative UK party foreign policy, which is not having a general alliance with anyone. I mean, Salisbury's even dubious about the Anglo-Japanese naval alliance, for God's sake. So I don't know. I think we'll just have to disagree on that one. But uh, all right, I'm, I'm going to play us two tunes before we leave. I'm going to play a little tiny one now, and that will give you time if you have any final thoughts, Rupert. All right? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think I've. Uh, all right. Well, I'm going to play a little tune first, and then then we'll leave. I just like this little tune, my own. There you go. That was God Save the King from the late 1940s. The original British TV used to play. So there we go. Long way different from now. Um, ben Gale says, you promised me Gladstone bashing in the chat. Uh, I've only had World War I talk. I do test Gladstone, Ben Gale. I'll do a stream on Gladstone at some stage if you want. All right. Uh, that's, that's one final point then. Um, there's probably no worse way that you could have handled uh, Egypt. Yeah. Yeah, Gladstone was like terrible on that stuff, you know. Uh, he wanted to and, 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 and uh, his betrayal of General Gordon when he sent him to Khartoum. Yeah, well, he he wanted to take on the um, to, to take on all of the uh, the, uh, the aesthetics, I guess, of um, concert. Uh, you know, acting as a part of a European concert, but was perfectly willing to take on all the costs of uh, of all the dirty work onto uh, onto himself and onto Britain. So, yeah. well, of the course, worst, the French. The the French, both worlds. To be fair, the French backed out at the last minute, as they so often do. Um, but uh, yeah, not not wrong. And I mean, Gladstone was known as the grand old man, you know, uh, G O M. And uh, conservatives turned that around in 1885 after um, Gordon was sacrificed in Khartoum to G O M, which was the uh, sorry uh, M O G, murderer of Gladstone, uh, murderer of Gordon, I think. And even in um melbourne in victoria there is a big statue of general gordon that was put up in 1885 and of course the uh, australians sent troops to um the sudan in 1885 to support the british army there first time the australians sent troops overseas so there we go um any any final thoughts thoughts for it no i think i'll do i think i've covered everything all right robert verlinden fell asleep in his chair that's a shame. <laughs> Thanks for coming on, uh, Rupert. You're always most welcome. Uh, I hope people found it an interesting discussion. And I'm going to end us with a, an appropriate tune, which, uh, whilst it's very famous, was actually, in many ways, the tune that marks the end of Britain as a Great Power.
Okay, guys, that was uh, obviously a long way to do for me. Like I said, famous tune. In some respects, it marked the end of Britain as a great independent power. Um, thank you very much to my guests, Rupert August and George, for coming on. <clears throat> uh, hopefully, people found this interesting. Don't forget to like the stream, and uh, please subscribe to the channel for more content. Uh, we'll be back on Saturday, UK time, which is early Sunday morning, Eastern Australian time, with our splendid isolation stream that we do every week, which is kind of named after the book, but really it's more named after like the period when Britain was a great independent power. So um, have fun, folks, and we'll see you soon. Good night, all.